Fuller. Hi there, I'm Cesar DeCall Jr. I'm Steve Wang. I'm Bill Corso. Hi, I'm Simon Lee. Hi, I'm Howard Berger. Hey, this is Don Lanning. I'm Jordi Shell for the Stan Winston School of Character hey there. Arts. I'm Steve Johnson for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Hi, I'm Alec Gillis, and welcome to the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. I think the outpouring of positive energy from fans of makeup and practical effects is so invigorating. We meet with a lot of young directors who come to us and they say uh, they, they remember the feeling they got when they watched a movie that had a makeup or a creature, a practical thing in it, and they want that for their films. Monster making should be fun. If you're not having fun making monsters, then you're doing something wrong, because it's the greatest thing in the world to be able just to create creatures from nothing, from your imagination. So, because of the way things are, you know, when you're building creatures for somebody else, you know, everyone has an opinion, so it's nice to say, hey, you know what, I'm gonna do this for myself. I'm gonna create my own universe, my own sandbox to play in, and that's exactly what I did. this going and to keep keep the love we have for movies and monsters going but it has to be to people that love this industry and want to make the coolest most badass monsters ever seen on film hello I am Ted Haynes for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. I am what you call a foam fabricator. As a foam fabricator, what I do is I cut a lot of foam. We use it primarily for prototyping. When we're, we've got a new creature, a new character that we want to quickly prototype with just in a couple of days. The foam fabrication lesson to begin with will be two lessons. The first one's going to take you through the designing, patterning, up through the basic shape of the Tyrannosaurus Rex that I'm building. So you'll have an entire surface in here that'll keep you know, it nice and flat. You know, tack these into place, but that's all about getting ready for our textures. So we gotta solidify the shape, but I'm happy. I'm getting to a point here where I'm seeing the form and uh, it's getting really fun. So a lot of, lot of sanding now. A lot of finishing up these little areas. Second lesson is all texture. So it's gonna be adding the uh, uh, sheet foam, different thicknesses, different techniques for texturing, skin layers and uh, bumps, lumps, uh, scale patterns, uh, the teeth, sculpting the teeth in L200 foam. What I'm doing here with the T-Rex in foam fabrication is taking it all the way to a finished product. And so you can use this, obviously, for doing anything from Halloween costumes to low-budget filmmaking. So uh, let's get started. Let's start chopping up some foam.
One of the magical things about a maquette is that the client comes in the room and they look on the table and there's something looking back. And so one of the things that I'm going to try to do uh, during this lesson is have uh, perhaps a smile, perhaps a frown, anger. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but we're going to explore expression as well as design elements. Okay. Uh, and once again, I think if you can, uh, I think all of us in looking for design uh, should include uh, a, a moment, a moment of performance that goes along with that character. Why, when the director comes in and meets this, this being for the first time that you've delivered, you want a situation where that director comes over and says, oh, oh, you got me. This is amazing. This is what we're talking about. This is the character I wrote in the script uh, six months ago. And here he is, and he's looking at me. Nothing, in my opinion, beats a maquette a three-dimensional representation there on the table in front of the clients. And, and I've seen this so many times, uh, and you have to smile to yourself when it, when it starts to happen. You have these nerves and you have these expectations of how you want your meeting to go, and in come all of these people in the suits and you're surrounded, and they start to design. They start to make their contributions to the work that you've done. That's the most exciting, that's the optimal, that's what we're all trying to do, is communicate with those clients, with our friends and with our uh, associates, uh, and get on the same page. And that's really what a maquette is about. Uh, I had a great time with you today. Thank you very much. From the Stan Winston School, this is Don Lanning. I'm Jamie Grove from the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Today I'm going to show you how to paint a Predator helmet. We're going to do a nice shiny version and we're going to do a extreme battle damage version. And the cool thing about today is we actually got some castings, some resin castings out of the molds from the, the very first Predator. So it's exciting for me to do it as well and I'm going to show you every step of the way on each process and how I got to achieve these looks. Hi there, I'm Cesar DeCal Jr. for Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Come with me as I take you through a tour of ZBrush. We're going to be exploring all the aspects of ZBrush that are going to allow you to sculpt and get into design. This isn't just any type of designing. This is designing with a forward momentum. What is designing at its core? The designing at its, at its core is basically going through the motions of getting as many numbers as we can out. And then eventually what ends up happening is that you start stumbling upon what I call the happy accidents. What is that all about? How can I get from A to B to C to all of a sudden get to Z so that I'm getting the gold? Save often, save all the time, because that will be the version that you're gonna need. We wanna put some curvature to it. We wanna make it whimsical. Over compress a region so that it looks more dynamic. It's very easy to fall in love with detailing. Detailing without the foundation is worthless. I'm really gonna start tightening up all these forms. And we have fat and we have tissue and um, so don't go in and make an ecrochet model. You want to use every single layer to the best. The, every polygon should be used and you should, nothing should be wasted. So there's moments for everything. So come on in.
I'm Bill Corso and welcome to the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. My lesson that I'm going to be teaching is creating a character from script to screen. In my lesson, I'm going to be meeting with an actress and we're going to be discussing a character. In this case, it's going to be involving beauty makeup and aging makeup, which happens in a lot of films. We're going to talk about the character, aspects of the character, maybe different ways on how to age her. We're going to discuss um, the process with her so she's comfortable and see if she has any ideas to bring to the table. I'm then going to do a Photoshop previs of what I'm thinking about and present it to her and to the director and get their approval. The next step would then be I'm going to create my makeup out of prosthetic transfers, prose transfers, because um, we're going to do it as if we don't have a lot of time and a lot of money on this production. So. I'm gonna show the process of sculpting prosthetic transfers on a generic face cast, uh, floating them off, and then applying them to the uh, actress. On test day, we're gonna, we're gonna start out with a nice beauty makeup. We're gonna then transition that into the prosthetic transfer makeup. And then we're gonna be able to stand back, look at kind of both side by side, uh, talk to the director, see what his opinions are, see what the actress's opinions are, and hopefully learn from whatever mistakes we make. And I'm sure we're gonna make a few. So that's part of the fun, that's part of the process, and it's always exciting, it's always different, and I'm glad to have you on this lesson with me. Hey, this is Don Lanning for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. While I'm talking, you're gonna see the sculpture go off. This is not a, a situation where I'm gonna sit there and slow down and finesse something or do something like that. The purpose is to show you how I block out. A lot of sculptors that I've worked with, I learned so much by watching them. My goal here today is to have you watch a lot of subject matter go off in a very quick format.
hope is that you take some of these lessons and use it in your own work. So let's jump right in. David Monzingo, the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Today, I'm going to teach you how to build this, and we're going to make this fight turn real ugly. Let's go. No. I'll kill you! No, taking you out! No, no. I'll kill no, you! No, no. You shouldn't have hit me! You shouldn't have hit me! I'm sorry, buddy. Just spraying blood off the side of a building, covering up a murder. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Monzingo for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts, and I'm going to be teaching a lesson on constructing a rod puppet. Why don't we start off by talking about what exactly is a rod control puppet? Well, basically, of all the different kinds of puppets to build, how do you move it around? There's hand puppets, there's animatronics, and there's rod puppets. Rod puppets are basically a character that has points coming out that are controlled externally. Unlike animatronic that has servos or hydraulics or something inside that's motivating the articulation, rod puppets are performed externally by a puppeteer to move things around. The cost of digitally removing a rod or a series of rods is far less than creating a whole digital character or, say, creating an animatronic character that doesn't have rods. That's why these have become so popular because you can get all the articulation that you want to see, all the nuances of one of these puppets without having to have the expense of going all digital or having to create an animatronic. It's very time consuming and very expensive as well. Almost every single puppet we do for any feature film or commercial has at least some portion of it controlled by a rod. Even if it's an animatronic character, there's some facet that will be puppeteered by a rod controlled mechanism.
Howdy, boys and girls. This is power. Power that can be controlled. Power that you can manage. Now get the feeling of brute power in your own hands with Jesse Gee's fantastic new Junkyard Robots. Learn to mold robot parts. Learn to make parts that look like real metal. Learn to use power tools to bend the robot parts to your will. Yes, power tools, just like the real grown-up robot makers use. Get the power that only you can control. See Jesse pick the parts. See Jesse put them together. Then learn to do it yourself with flashing fire rocket lamps and spooky glowing robot eye. Be sure that you ask for Jesse Gee's Junkyard Robots, the new sensational lesson from the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. And you will learn to have the power. And remember, kids, if it says Gee, then it's for me. Hello, I'm Jordu Shell for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. And today, I'm going to be showing you how I go about creating a humanoid character maquette. It's so important to have patience with yourself as you do this stuff. And I know that because I've had a million frustrating times attempting to create things throughout my life. You know, when I was hit with a challenge, you know, it, it, it could be very, very frustrating if I couldn't get it right away. It's very, very important to be patient with yourself as an artist and whatever it is, whether it's latex, silicone, clay, you know, whatever it is, be patient with yourself and with the medium. You will get there. It may take longer than you want, but you will get there. To get all these proportions just right, it's such a specific thing, and it's something that we see every day you know that the tiniest piece of clay can make all the difference in the world. In creating this, I will be able to use it as a guideline for everything that is subsequent. In establishing whoever I cast the body of, I can use this as a reference and say, this is the pose and to use it to compare against when posing my actor, when uh, tweaking the figure in whatever way I do. This is kind of a guideline for everything that I want the finished piece to be. Hi, I'm Rick Allenson for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Welcome to my lesson on animatronic character servo control.
I'm Richard Landon for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts, and this is my lesson on Cable Basics, Introduction to Cable Mechanisms. We're going to do a quick overview and some construction tips on how to build single axis, double axis, and multi-stage technical mechanisms that are of all sizes, shapes, and constructions. This is cool. This is sexy. I like it. How, does it, how do I make this into a working tentacle? We're going to be discussing tentacle mechanisms, finger mechanisms. how they can be applied as elephant trunks, monkey tails, cat's tails. The nylon provides a lot of return, and the opposing cable provides the rest of the return, and it goes the opposite direction. Pretty much any kind of monster appendage you would care to know. Hi, I'm Rick Lazzaruni for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts, and this is my lesson on organic mechanics. It's moving. Um, this is a long lesson, uh, and it delves into uh, what it takes to get a lot of expressiveness out of an animatronic creature. Uh, in this lesson, I what take it shows you, you is you've uh, got to have all of these servos going, and for each servo, okay. you've got to have now it's a unit. Okay. Now I can actually take a, if, if, if it's a little too okay. rough. Now we got to do a bunch of other stuff to this. I can take a, a Dremel big sander bigger, to it. Bigger, 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 bigger hole. And here's a bigger one. To embed that do pulley it. there. So I'm going to go a little bit beyond that. When I put this back into its space. All right. Let's double check. Nicely fits in there. I'll probably have to do a little more grinding, a little more clearance here. So it can rotate, because I didn't That's cut it in a perfect circle. That's going to be full open. I think I need to pick away. If I don't get them in the right place, they'll be aligned and you've got a picture of the skin being attached to that. And it's going to look silly. We're going to be the move actuating. There's a silver on this look guy. to this. That's because I with servos. fluxed it with so acid. So here's where it indicates 10% of the rate B. It's getting heated up and you can see how my 10% of the rate A. I'm just going to do the right side because again, I want to get this all done and I want to put the skin on. And if I like the way that this looks, then I can go. duplicate let's, it on let's the other side. Roll this, this up. Butyrate. These top teeth are going to fit inside. There's a lot of movement going on there. So if this is all the so way down. So if I turn the receiver back on, you can see the space is, is Here, limited is inside. Right? Now I've got yeah. that jaw, once again, making sure I'm at the yeah. mid-range. Okay. I'm going to do something else. As I mix this propoxy, I'll tell you a little I'm story. Do something else. I got another call for a squirrel today. Just say no to squirrels. <laughs> Let's see if that accomplished my dreams. This is always a weird part put the lower because lip here, you're taking so I'm gonna lose the jaw kind of a robotic understructure there. and then you're I'll adding a skin the jaw. to it. So Similar that's like gonna this. happen. What I'd like to do is to complete this a and little so further for the next uh, lesson. And I think we want to get into give making eye the blinks. eyes move, uh, making the eyes blink, and adding a little bit of lower eye expression. This has been Rick Lazzarini for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. And I hope you've enjoyed my lesson on organic Ready? mechanics. Return.
Hey there, I'm Steve Johnson for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. And this and is... I'm Billy Bryan. And today we're gonna show you how to design outside of the box. We're gonna show you something you never could have imagined because that's kind of what you have to do with audiences when you have to do an effect. You have to show them something they never dared imagine. Mr. Bryan here has come up with some amazing techniques to fabricate creatures, and we're gonna show you exactly how he did it. So Lord of Illusions was the first one, and then we used it in everything from, let's see, species, the big cocoon that Thomas Hamstrit comes out of, you know, because you can make tentacles that can breathe really easily. Uh, we used it on Spear, we made jellyfish. We used it on phantoms. We made an amazing thing on phantoms. We used it on every chance we could. One of the great things about them is you can make a shape get this big, but it, it gets so tiny when it's not inflated, so we can easily hide these bladders that were multi-tentacled under appliances, have them scored, and then when you inflated them, it's like, how in the name of God did that come out of there? Rick Baker called me up on, on Men in Black. He goes, can you just make, help me out make a couple aliens? I'm like, sure, no problem. So he gave me three aliens to make, and of course, I absolutely insisted that we make one out of garbage bags, and I tried to pitch the concept to Rick, and I you know, brought a bunch of it, specifically edited a tape to show him some of the stuff we had done behind the scenes on Species, and he's like, Steve, I'm giving you $150,000 for this creature, you're gonna make it out of a trash bag. And I'm like, yes. Actually, we used plastic for makeup effects in The Shining. We, the greatest way to do a zombie, put thin plastic and tear it off, and, and the, the legs of the woman in room 309, when she steps out of the tub, the makeup is basically plastic, and different colors of shaving cream, and it's so, so creepy. And again, we charged $3 million for it. <laughs> the idea was we wanted to see a mechanical scientific device grow a fetus right before our eyes. Of course, these days it would probably be done digitally, but I came to Bill and I said, can you do this? And he goes, I'll do one, one I'll show you the veins grow in it. And it was amazing, and it was an accident. It did leak in the water tank a little bit, but it made it look cooler. <laughs> All and these little dark eye spots up here it looked like a vein system, a capillary system. It was amazing. From that one little thing, isn't that amazing? We did Lord of Illusion, species, species, species two, phantom, sphere, said, evolution, of is... outer limits, men in black two. And great! I think it's how you said it. Hi, I'm Simon Lee for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Welcome to my lesson. Hi, I'm Shannon Shea. This is the Stan Winston School of Character Arts, Garage Monsters 2. Started with an armature, sculpting armature. I showed you how to make a sculpting armature. We talked about sculpting in the oil clay. We went through a molding process. We went through a latex casting process. We went through a teeth sculpting, teeth molding, teeth casting. We put membranes in the corners of the mouth. We made a tongue out of a plastic bag. 
Finally, we painted it, we painted eyes, and we covered the eyes with five minute epoxy, all to get a hand puppet like this. If I can make it, you can make it. I'm Shannon Shea for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts, and this has been Garage Monsters. All right, so everyone should know this voice. I'm Stan Winston. It starts with the, the concept art, the drawings, the paintings, the sculpting of all the, the phenomenal artists and technicians and technical minds that work at the studio, which is why I like to come to work every day, is to, to see this work in progress, uh, to be at the center of this kind of renaissance arena of fine artists, the best drawers, the best painters, the best sculptors. This is what it's all about as far as I'm concerned. This is the, the core of what uh, the studio is about, which is, is us as artists. Hi, I'm Tim Martin for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts, and today I'm going to be drawing a uh, design. Basically, the entire thing I'm going to do with a mechanical pencil and a mechanical eraser. The concept of this whole creature is it's going to be a, a mix of a bunch of different characters that the Stan Winston Studio did over the years. The movie The Relic, Predator. 
Alien Queen in here, the Terminator, Viathon, Pumpkinhead of course, Edward, Scissorhands, Raptor, from Jurassic Park, Galaxy Quest. And of course, I'm gonna incorporate a little bit of Stan in there. Hi, my name is Andres Garcia Price. I'm a storyboard artist. I'm here today with the Stan Winston School of Character Arts to talk to you a little bit about storyboarding. Today we're gonna to be dealing with basic sketching. Every drawing is informed by, by perspective. Your horizon, whether you see it in the imagery, is somewhere. If you're looking down, the horizon is up here and that's gonna affect where all of these lines are intersecting, how all of these shapes are playing out, and that's gonna let anybody who's looking at it know, oh, we've got an angle that's higher up and looking down. You know, you're really offering ideas to help spark ideas. A person who doesn't know immediately what they want only needs to see something concrete to have the emotional flash that sends them in the direction, like, it's not this at all, but I'm seeing it now. Let's take an Old West setting. Let's say there's an um, old homesteader and his young daughter uh, outside in front of their house and they see zombies approaching. Maybe they see these zombies approaching. Maybe these zombies are gonna start to show up before they've seen them. Maybe we're gonna see them together before they notice. And then there's a chase because it's zombies and I'm pretty sure somebody's probably gonna get bitten and then there might be more chasing or there might be some bloody mayhem, we'll see. Let's say this is the scene that we're looking at. We are now in seven seconds, five, four. Are you scaring me? Three, two, one, we are live. Hello everyone out there, I'm Jordi Shell. This is going to be a unique lesson that I give you. First of all, I don't think anyone's given this kind of lesson before, which is going to be realistic Sculpey head creation. So taking a translucent material, sculpting in it, painting it, finishing it, all for you. But it's also going to be a simultaneous live webcast, which means that we are on uh, Google Hangouts. I'm going to be fielding questions during this actual shooting process. Do you usually paint on unhardened sculpting? I almost always do it this way because what's going to happen is when I actually bake it in the oven, these colors will bake into it. They'll become permanent because I'm actually tinting the Sculpey. But that doesn't mean I don't still love you, dear viewer. Oh, you guys wish you could see this. All right, I'm gonna get to these ears now. And remember when you're sculpting ears, they slant back at a bit of an angle. They're not straight up and down. They slant just a little bit back like this, not like this. Now I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna very gently bring back out some of the white of the eye. So, let's get started. It's gonna be a really exciting lesson, and it's gonna happen lickety-split just like that. And I think you're gonna really enjoy it. It's one of my favorite things to do. I think it's a lot of fun. So, let's get into it. Me 
mirrors and trick photography uh, go back a, a long way. I would say 1862, there was a fellow named Henry Pepper who created an attraction that became known as Pepper's Ghost. We're going to recreate that effect. Soon after that, uh, mirrors began to come into motion picture work. Directors would want shots of an oncoming train directly to the camera. They want to cut at the last minute. It was much safer to just mount a mirror on the tracks and just have the train smash the mirror to bits while the camera was recording the action from the side safer. We'll be using the same type of split screen idea in our lesson while we create someone being dragged into the fourth dimension. Lastly, we want to talk about a very special visual effect artist. His name was Eugene Schufdam. He was born in Germany. And he was responsible for doing the visual effects on the classic film Metropolis. Mr. Schufdam invented a process where he could combine miniatures with live action using a mirror. He turned that mirror into both a window and a mirror. Some of you may say that mirrors are old fashioned and we don't need them. But the thing is, mirrors are merely one tool and a whole bag of tricks that are offered to you not only for movies, but for stage and screen. Magicians have used mirrors since time immemorial. And working with mirrors is an excellent discipline for visual effects and for life. And it's really neat. Beam is in. Dissolve from the beam to her. I raise it up, she runs out. Yes, yes, we have the stuff to do the effect. Welcome, everybody. This is Don Lanning from the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Today, what we're going to do is, uh, is so much fun because today we're going to imagine once again that the client has called and changed directions. And so we're going to open ourselves to a new take, a new concept. Now, uh, most productions, we don't have time to go ahead and start a new head, and there are cool elements here, and he's up and running. So we're going to move this sculpture into something different. I mentioned this before, but I gotta mention it again. When you see me render something, or you see me figure something out, you're supposed to be saying, well, that's his adventure. What can I do in my sculpting? I see the linear way that he works and that he goes on these missions. How can I make my own missions, my own techniques? How would I make a tool uh, that would emulate a certain kind of texture and mechanically lay it in? Um, and you're also trying to spot things that I do wrong that you don't want in your kit as well. You're shifting. And every time you get a piece of education like this, you're going through and you're looking for those kernels of knowledge that are going to help you not only to make money, but to be strong and powerful in your contribution to media and art. For the Stan Winston School, I want to thank you all for spending the day with me. Good night. Schoenberg for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. This is my lesson, Mastering Effects Disasters. So here's what happened. The director calls me over, it's right before rap last night, and he says, hey, remember Matt? He was gonna get a gunshot to the gut. In fact, we decided that wasn't dramatic enough. So what we wanna do is we're gonna shoot him with a shotgun and his head's gonna explode, and that'll be the way that he dies. Okay, is that gonna be digital? Oh no, we'd like to do it practically. Well, I don't have an exploding head. Oh, I know. I don't have a head that matches Matt. I know. All right, we'll have something for you. Come on, listen. Listen. Listen to me. I don't have your money. I need more time. More time? That's not good enough. Come on. You're dead. Oh. Let's go, take it away. By the way, there. this can do like an animatronic lip sync thing, right? No. Okay, it can't. Hi, 
I'm Bruce D. Mitchell with the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Today we're gonna make a mask. So we're gonna cover all our steps and how to get to this point. This is a mask that's gonna fit your head. We're gonna show you how to create it. We're gonna cover everything from the understructure that you're gonna need. And we're gonna go through paint stages. We're even gonna get in some leather craft. I'm Bruce D. Mitchell. Thanks for joining me on behalf of the Stan Winston School of Character Art.
about to start. We're about to start. Get nervous as soon as he does this. Hey guys, good morning if you're in the US, good afternoon if you're in Europe, good evening if you're in Asia. This is the very first episode of The Monster Show. Uh, this is something suggested actually by Stan Winston's uh, widow, my mom, Karen Winston, many years ago. She said, you guys are doing lessons, but you should talk to the legends of the industry as well in a format that's much looser. And today, we have our very first guest, Steve Johnson is in the house. That's right. Hello, kids. And, 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 and I, I was telling Matt right before the cameras rolled that, uh, that he, ha he clearly hasn't done his homework. Look at this. This is a coffee table. It's a case. He didn't start with an opening monologue. Well, we're, you're going you're gonna to do the monologue. opening. Can you do the opening monologue, I Steve? I but you might not like it. No, no, no. Let's... Steve, well, they, they, they promised me that anything goes, including sexual acts. They did. They said this is okay. It's right? Steve Johnson. Johnson. What, 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 how but can we? It's the internet, and you can't stop it. Right? <laughs> you can't do anything about it. Um, would, would you like to do a brief opening monologue, Steve? Have you, have you heard my Red Hot Chili Peppers gag? Okay. Let's hear it. All right, this is the opening monologue for our first ever I, I, I The Monster Show. I'll speak straight to the camera. Why did the Red Hot Chili Peppers cross the road? Why, Steve? Well, they were running away from the rehab clinic. What? How many red hot chili peppers does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many, Steve? Well, it depends on how recently they've shot up. Oh, my goodness. Okay, Did you catch you that? What do you do when Anthony Kiedis, Anthony Kiedis, the Grammy Award winning lead singer, of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, comes over to your house for a party, and you can't get out of the bathroom. I, I have no idea, Steve. Call the coroner! Oh, my goodness. Okay. He overdose what humor. Does a, what does a, what is a banana and the Red Hot Chili Peppers have in common? What? Well, a banana, of course, is high in potassium. <laughs> okay. One more, one more. Steve. <laughs> one more. You said I could do They're it. all watching, by the way. Okay, okay. Anthony and uh, Chad and Flea. <laughs> They're okay. all watching. Uh, what, what does Harriet Tubman, the great Harriet Tubman, have in common with the Red Hot Chili Peppers? What's that, Well, Steve? Harriet Tubman, of course, was a heroine to the slaves. Oh, and on that one, thank you. Did that you was our favorite. Did Anthony Kiedis recently joined the Mile High Club? Did those guys? That's right. He shot up on Mount Everest. All right. Steve. Did those guys wrong you at some point in your life, Steve? What, no. What's going on? It's just funny. It's humor. You were missing the opening monologue. Don't well, we have we have our opening monologue. Apologies to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of yours, and I don't believe any of the rumors about you guys dabbling in any of that rock star stuff. So, um, welcome, dude. This is very very exciting. Uh, the coolest thing about this live broadcast is that it's not just going to be me asking questions, it's going to be you asking questions. You guys are driving this uh, ship to some degree. So if you have questions for Steve, start typing them in now. Throughout the broadcast, we're going to be looking at them. Are they coming in now? I could even start asking. Um, but in, in other words, the responsibility is on you uh, to, to ask some great questions. He'll go anywhere, pretty much, with his answers. Um, you're going to get the uncut Steve Johnson, so unedited. the unedited Steve Johnson. So please ask any questions you have about his amazing career in Creature Effects, or what he's up to today, which we're going to talk about. And if things get boring, we'll leave it back to Matt. That's right. As you find yourself nodding off, um, I'm going to give you a few shout-outs of people who are watching right now. Um, we've got a little bit. Yes, there we are. Venezuela is watching. That's David Pernia. Um, Paisano, that's from Nabil Tushi. Uh, Portugal is watching. Uh, we got ML, we got, hey, how's it going, ML? From the UK watching. So there's people all over the place. Let me just check in on this. Uh, so echoey, says Laura McLaughlin. How are we doing on Echo, guys? Okay. Uh, We've got more Echo than anyone. What's that? Can I ask you to scoot your seat back? We're having a, a little furniture. Uh, Move. Right here? Okay, great. Um, and then the other place you guys can all talk to us is on our web page. Um, so please write your questions for Steve. A few things we want to talk about today. The first thing I want to talk about with you um, is your career. To set the stage for those who may not know you, may not know your work, um, let's talk about some of the movies they they've seen your work in, starting back on your days with Rick Baker. Let's go back there. Yeah, Rick Baker, that was a very magical time in my life. And um, um, the first movie that I did with Rick was actually American Werewolf in London. 
right out of the gate. How America, do you like that? A, a classic that is yet to be beat. I know uh, so many people come up to me and say that that movie changed their lives. That's the way they got in the business. I was 19 when I worked on it. It's like, I mean, how, how's that for luck? But I'd met Rick long before. Did you have any clue uh, on that film that you were part of history? Or was it just a little... I, you know, I know I didn't. Neither did I on Ghostbusters, all these things, because when I was... I think part of it is that when you're... And all you young kids take note. When you're 17, 18, 19, 20, you don't have 50 or 50 or five years of experience behind you, you're, you're under your belt like I do. And I think you're just... You're more like the way a cat perceives the world. They mm -hmm. don't know how their owners push a button and a light comes no, in. No, just right? in the moment. Yeah. That sounds fun. Let's go to England. So I had no fucking idea. It was just like Rick said, make this. And I said, I don't know how. And he said, well, you'll fucking figure it out. And you guys did. Yeah. It's incredible. That That is the best to this day uh, in camera werewolf transformation ever. Uh, so you like it better than The Howling? I love The Howling transformation. Let's, I do. Let's be honest. We're all about brutal honesty here. I, I love The Howling transformation. Um, but I think that the American Werewolf transformation, the combination of the music, um, and everything about it, I think, was a much more classic scene. And it's stood the test of time in that way. I love Botine's work in The Howling. It's outrageous. Uh, but I think that's a better transformation. I'm one of the only people that's worked on both films. I worked yes. with Botine on The Howling and I worked with Rick on American He's Werewolf. He's worked on The Howling and American <coughs> Werewolf in London. I, I, you're, you're, this is a... It, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's history! I, I have to say that I prefer the transformation in the Howling. But I, and everybody says that the American Werewolf transformation holds up, and I'm going to get murdered for saying this. I don't think it does. I look back at it, and you go from one prosthetic hand cut, which is a makeup, cut to Mickey Mouse or whomever, and then you go to the mechanical stretch o hand, and it's a completely different it's color. Way, and it's way further. It's the only issue I have with the transformation is the and stillness the of his low. body mm -hmm. in a couple See, shots where he's... Coming out now. Yeah, I mean, American you can... American Werewolf is the shittiest werewolf. Oh, jeez. Put on film. Rick it's Baker. Matt Winston is saying this. If you're right watching, as w I don't agree. <laughs> it's not the shittiest. Come one. on, no, I love that. I'm just that. saying it doesn't hold In up. fact, I remember, because that was the very first year that I they... I can say that that they had a, uh, an Oscar category for best That's makeup right. was American Werewolf in London against my father for Heartbeeps. And while I loved Heartbeeps, I said to Dad when the nominations came down, I said, Dad, you're, you're not going to win this one. And he what, goes, I know. two I years know. old? You knew how to no, talk I was eight, I was 11, and, yeah. and I was savvy about monster movies at that point. But uh, come no, on. that was an exciting It's hard time. to beat, hard to beat really, a werewolf. really, really was. Um, well, I, I would like to, let's move on. We're just going to go through, we're going to get back to these because people ask okay. questions about all these films. Let's talk about the next professional milestone in your creature effects life <clears throat> after okay. American Werewolf. Uh, the next one that I would consider. Yes. Well, clearly Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters, anyone? <laughs> I just rewatched that film uh, two weeks ago with my children. Yeah. And fantastic. It holds up. So funny. That the, one does hold up. Yes, it does. Unlike American Werewolf. Well, a little bit of stop motion with the with the Gozer Beasts is a little. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, that, Randy. That doesn't hold Sorry, up as Rand, well, Randy, but you know, Randall William Cook. It's yeah. still enjoyable and it's real, and I enjoy watching bad stop motion it, better than great CG any day of the week. That's um, a nice way to put it. But yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, I had worked. I came to California when I was 18. I had been doing this stuff in my garage since I was 12. You know, like so many of us, right? Just you, there's you just can't not do it. Like people ask Stephen King why he writes, and his answer is because I can't not write. Yep. And everyone that has a passion for making monsters, everyone that has a passion for our business, they simply have no choice, right? So I was doing it since I was uh, since the earliest days I can remember. And Sorry I'm guys. <laughs> can we keep it down a little bit off camera? Johnny. Huh? It's, it's super loud. Can we keep it down a little bit? So, Go so ahead, Steve. in any case, I was a, a huge fan of Rick Baker, and so he came to a convention in Texas, and I, I had the nerve to go up and meet him, and started corresponding with him, and so I went through the whole thing, you know, and, and many people have done this with me, you know, contacting me, they get the job, blah, 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 they start, and, and end up having a career. I mean, I've been instrumental in so many incredible artists, Christian Tinsley, Joel Harlow, Dave Dupuy, Bill Corso, and I feel really, really fortunate to have help give them a leg up. It wasn't for me, it had been somebody else that just happened to go through my studio. And it's still, that's a cool thing. I feel great about it. Yeah. It, just like Rick had Canem, Botini, me, Kat, Kats, Kats, Kazu. Kazu. Um, so in any case, but you know, at some point, so 
after after working with Canham, Rick introduced me to Canham. Then he introduced me to Greg Bo Canham, four-time Oscar winner. Then Rob Botin. How many Oscars? One. Eight? Seven? No, no, Botin. Oh, Botin, one. Yeah. Then they Baker, just gave eight? It to him. Seven? Yeah, eight? Okay. Something like that. Um, but, you know, at some point, it becomes a matter of, you know, even when you're working with your idols, um, after you've done your apprenticeship, after you've worked in the trenches for years and years and years, it becomes a matter of no longer is the master correct and you don't have a clue what you're doing. So, of course, it's yes, master, yes, master. At some point, it's like, I see what he's doing. I could no, probably no, do no, that. No, 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 no. Better. Now it's a matter of opinion. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of opinion. That's the way you think it should be. Right. Well, you know what? Fuck you. I'm going to open my own shop. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's how that whole thing worked. And so I went and you were, we were, just, just, and circles you worked back with Boss and point. it headed up circles to Boss. Back. I went back to Ghost, went back to Boss for Ghostbusters, or went to Boss for Ghostbusters. And it was just unbelievable because for the first time, I was the guy. Yeah. I didn't have Rob or Rick or Greg saying, you idiot, make it bigger, make it smaller. I just had an unending contingent of executives and their girlfriends and wives and art directors and producers and production designers doing it. <laughs> so it was kind of the same, but it was still me at 2 a.m. saying, no, I want the nose to be shaped like this. That's right. right? And, and from so that point, after Ghostbusters, you never looked back and you were your, your own boss throughout. And. Uh, uh, again, for those of you who know Steve, you know that he is one of a, ver a small handful of creature effects artists who have uh, become stars in a, in a way, you know, and uh, there was a generation of them that would lead armies in the heyday, and you were one of them. So um, I, we're going to get into the rest of the career. I do want to get to some of your questions, because questions are coming in now. And, uh, Don't we get commercial breaks like on real shows? There's no commercial breaks here, although we will take a, probably a restroom break at some point because I have a bladder the size of an acorn. Um, <laughs> that is true. I was told uh, <laughs> we could just do it right here. So, uh, Long Living Dude says, Robert Jown Downey Jr., is that you? Uh, we've got people from Portugal. No, I've never heard that. Um, Buffalo Lamb says, Steve's mic volume is quite low. Are the rest uh -oh. of you having that problem? Uh, let's check into that. It's probably a good uh, one. Ghostbusters is a classic. Uh, and what was the most challenging? This is from Jao. Alves, uh, what was the most challenging creature in Ghostbusters for you, Steve, while we're talking about Ghostbusters? Uh, the most challenging, well, God, they were all challenging because we did them in very non-expected ways. I did not do it the way Rick Baker or Rob Bottin taught me how to do it. I just took a completely new approach because, again, I was trying to prove myself. And so, for instance, with Slimer, we didn't do it like ILM, unfortunately. Sorry, Mark Siegel did it on Ghostbusters 2 because they did the effects for Ghostbusters, where they made a pneumatic, highly articulated, I made a big soft Tex Avery puppet that could just go, when it, you know, because I looked at mm -hmm. cartoons, yeah. and when a cartoon smiles, the cheeks don't do this. They go wham, and the head goes down, and the eyes pop out. And so I wanted just a big, soft piece of rubber that I could get as many human hands and as direct of a puppeteering technique as I could get. And that's how we did that one. But it, you know, it was good. Nobody had ever done it before. So I was like, wow, is this stupid or is this cool? Is it gonna make me look like an idiot or a genius? There's uh, a fine line. <laughs> There's a very and fine I know, line. I I think I've crossed it many times. <laughs> Um, so Slimer, you would say, was the most challenging? Well, no, I mean, you look at the librarian puppet, and that had to be, you know, I, I learned up from both Botin and Baker on The Howling and American Werewolf that one of the difficulties in getting a really complex effect to happen on camera is the orchestration of all the puppeteers. Yeah. So I said, there's got to be another way to do this. And so I, I hired a genius, can't remember his name right now because I'm getting senile. It's we all okay. Are. It's okay. Uh, It'll come to you. Yeah. Uh, to, to create a system where literally the, the librarian puppet was basically a change of puppet, like the American werewolf puppets and also like the, the howling puppets, except it was far more complex. Mm -hmm. The head flattened. It extended this way. The jaw came out, mm -hmm. but the eyes also sunk in. Her torso stretched out. It bent over. The arm stretched from here to here, from here to here. Literally from the waist up, it was a, it was a change of thing. Her clothes had to rip off. So I said, we'll never get 35 people in concert doing this stuff. So if this is going to work, it has to be operated by one person. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, 
I, I went to this guy, this genius engineer. Again, I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry, whoever did this. Genius engineer, genius if you're out engineer. there, please write in and your name. He literally and Steve. sequenced the cable controllers to two levers. And this seems prehistoric now when we talk about, you know, digital animation and not. Hey, not sometimes CG, you can't beat good old cable controls. Yeah, so he sequenced them all in two. So one guy could sit back with his feet up and go, bam, and an old woman turned into a demon. Fantastic. Yeah, it was fun. Um, so that one, we got the cab driver, obviously, which I know was a, a sort of one-man job for you. Didn't mm -hmm. you do, did you actually mechanize that one as well? I did. I did everything because I had done the jack now, We're talking about that fantastic cab driver when the city's going crazy and Ghostbusters and... Uh, All the ghosts are flying out. Yeah, and the cab driver turns around and he's a corpse. So well, that was, my, that, that, that was my audition for the job because... Um, Let's hear about that. Well, I, I went in. Rick Baker, actually, we had just gotten back from a year in London doing Greystoke, and Richard Edlin had just opened Boss Film Corporation, and he wanted to have an umbrella corporation that would do the optical effects, the models, um, the, the, and, and, the, and the animatronics. One, one stop shop. Everything, everything effects wise. And he, so he called up Rick and said, Rick, Rick said, are you crazy? I'm tired, I've been in Africa for a year. I'm not, not are you kidding me? And besides, I don't work for other people, but here, I'm kind of sick of Steve Johnson. <laughs> Why don't he you go talk you to off. He did, actually. I know. Oh. I, I thought about that for years. Well, it worked goes, out for you. Just talk to this kid. But I went in there, and I'm, I was like, again, I was a child. And they're not going to give me millions of dollars to do this stuff. So they said, you can, we've got to shoot the zombie cab driver in two weeks. Make it. We're shooting it in New York, and if it works, we'll hire you. And so it did work. And so what I wanted to do is I'd been in charge of the jack puppet for American Werewolf. Mm -hmm. And that was a hand puppet. It was like a Muppet, right? And not, that not, one plays in the theater? Is yeah. that the scene that Well, there are in? sequential makeups, yes. prosthetics on Griffin. But Dunn. the puppet, so American Werewolf, uh, the scene he's talking about in the porn theater yeah. at the sort of final level of degradation. Yeah, I forget. I think everybody knows everything about these movies, but sometimes they sometimes don't. They don't. Sometimes, sometimes they don't, and we have to educate them. Sometimes they um, tune in to see psychopaths. Um, so you had done that. I had done that for Rick, and he, of course, designed it, but he tasked me with putting it together and mechanizing it and everything. And, and it was, a, you know, Kevin Brennan operated it like this. And he even had to move the eyes with his finger while he was doing the jaw and the head movement. And it was like being in hell for him. <laughs> and also, if you think about this, you're not going to get, if you have to build a puppet. Please don't do that, Steve. If you have to build a puppet. This is a neck, family show. If you have to um, build a puppet. Steve neck Johnson, around that, uh, my apologies for the gestures. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's going to be thick, right? Wait, was I the one going there? I went there. I was you, the one that went there. I've been reasonable. Okay. So I, it's going to make a thick neck, and you're not taking advantage of the fact that it's a puppet and not a prosthetic buildup on an actor. Right. And so I wanted to one-up Rick on everything I did on this, which was to make a thinner neck and to do all of these things because I'm a prick that and way. And you had two weeks to pull it off. I did, yeah. And, and it worked great. It's a, a classic moment from the film. Like I said, I yeah, just rewatched it two... Uh, Two weeks ago, and my kids were blown away. I'm boring you um, now. Are you on no, Facebook? No, no, it was he's questions. He's Facebook. Yeah, no, I'm here. looking at this your is questions. Live, live webinar. When you see me looking at my computer, it's because I'm. Okay. <laughs> You're returning uh, emails? This is off the. Uh, I, Iowa, Iway Shay, hey, Iway Shay, says, What are you smoking? Is that a vape? It What's is. What's going on here? It is. Um, I'm trying to quit smoking, and this By thing smoking. Is, this thing is very satisfying. Uh, because you know, look. Look at that. It's like Sherlock fucking Holmes. <laughs> look at all that smoke. <laughs> and there's a massive amount of nicotine in here, but you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think the jury's still out on whether this is safer or even more dangerous than cigarettes. But I do know this if I were doing this interview, you wouldn't let me light up a cigarette. Uh, no, no, we, we'd, we'd let it go. Would we'd, you? We'd let it go. Do you yeah. have any? Uh, no, <laughs> not on this. Um, I'm going to just quickly shout out some people who are here. We've got. L. Chris Mike from Mexico. Uh, we have Buffalo Lamb. Hey, Buffalo, we know you. Who says Ghostbusters is a classic? Um, we've got the Turbra watching. I don't know where you're from, the Turbra or Turbre. Uh, let us know. We've got Cristiano Cardoso with us. Uh, ML, of course, who loves Ghostbusters and wants to ask you about your favorite projects, but we'll get to that. Um, Laura is here, Rochigiani. Um, Death Becomes You! Our pal Death Becomes You, how are you, man? Um, who says you are quite a character, and, and uh, I agree. He's talking about you, though, right? Uh, no, no, no. He says Steve Johnson. <laughs> he name checks you. No Big Al Tuscus? Uh, let's see if Big Al is here. Big Al, you here? Let us know. Um, 
And let's see. The, get it, Steve. That's Megan. Megan's here. <laughs> hey, Megan. Megan, Megan Arford here, a very, very talented makeup artist in her own right. Uh, face off. Uh, season one. Season one. Yeah, we just yeah. worked together on uh, Rob Hall's new film, a new feature called That's Fear right. Clinic with Robert England. Megan. Starring Robert Megan, England. what's Megan's Facebook? Uh, let's give her a shout out right now. Her Facebook? Uh, Megan Arreford, don't fuck with me. I don't know. A R E F O R D. Hey, Megan, write your Facebook uh, I don't link think in she the wants comments. All these no, no, you need followers. You're brilliant. <laughs> um, okay, let's get back to the, some questions. Um, are there any pictures that people want to know? Uh, the Turbray wants to know, getting back to that cab driver. Mm -hmm. um, do, do, did you document the process? Do you have pictures of the mechanisms? Were you good about that? Back then, I was doing a lot of drugs. Listen, I only had two weeks in my bedroom to do this. What are you going to do? I had no choice. What do you kids. mean back then? It was Steve? the 80s. It was the no, no, early no, no. 80s. It but was what do you okay. mean back then? It makes it sound like that was an isolated time in your life well, when you dabbled, which right, we'll get right. into. That's enough. Uh, we're going to talk about Steve's <laughs> book. Um. I, I, do, I do have some photos, and, uh, and, and, and there's great news on that, too, on the archives, and how those are going to be coming out, so we can come back to that, oh, unless fantastic. you want to talk about it now. Sure, this is a great time. Um, I've got... The question okay, is, does, does, does Steve have records of, of all the stuff he's built and indeed i do i learned this from richard edlin uh from boss film corporation the guy that owned and, and operated that company he hired a full-time archivist that would film photograph and archive every step of every project that we did and i thought wow you know what that's probably a good idea i don't know why now but someday it might be a really good idea to document all this stuff and so i did the same for almost my entire 30-year career and i've got hundreds of thousands of behind the scenes photographs tens of thousands of hours of behind the scenes, never before seen um, footage of tests that we did. And usually, often, unfortunately, the test photography and the shoots that we do in our own studio look end up looking better than what it does in the film. You can really see it, you know? Alec and Tom's ADI tests prove that yeah. right there. Uh, and of course, well, and of you know, there's some Stan Winston studio videos too there you go. There that you might go. prove it. Yeah. Um, but you know, the, the, Dad had the same feeling. He knew that every job you're making a never before created prototype and you had to document it. This was history in the making every time out of the gate. Right. And now you've got, I, oh, by the way, let's give a shout out to the Rubber, uh, Rubber Rules channel on YouTube because they can actually check out some of your stuff right now. Yes, they can. You want to tell them where uh, to go? Well, it's, uh, I'm not sure. I haven't seen, been there for a while. It's Rubber Rules on YouTube. Yeah, just yeah, type in easy. Rubber Rules YouTube, subscribe, and you're <clears> going to see, although it's been a little dormant for a while. You're they just see... contacted me. They want to they pull it back up. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. But um, what Rubber Rules is, is, so again, all of these archives, you know, hundreds of thousands of designs and photos and all this wonderful behind the scenes footage that no one's ever seen. I thought, what am I going to do with it? Number one, it takes a warehouse, 20,000 square feet, you know, to, to have every type of video capture that's ever been created since the 60s, right? Yeah. And also to keep all these binders of photos and negatives and slides and the actual original drawings. I'm like, this isn't going to work. I'm going to keep these in a dark warehouse. I'm going to go over there once every five years pull out the old monkey bone uh, d d photo album and jerk off to it? Oh, What's that about? Monkey you know, bone. You know what, <laughs> what kind of movie is that, monkey bone? You've never seen monkey bone. Is that the kind of movie that you did? You Henry pleasure Selleck, yourself to? Henry Selleck Goodness. directed it. Brendan Fraser. <laughs> Great facts. Um, by so, the way, any of you um, excited about the fact that Steve is going to uh, commit to digitizing and sharing his archive? I know I am. Say yes in the uh, yes, comments. Yes, that's exactly what's going on. We're putting it into a digital asset management site. And Chris Dotson in Tennessee is doing that right now. And he's getting digital very asset close. Asset management. Damn. Damn. It, damn. It's called. Damn. It's a damn Got site. It. Got it. And uh, this way, it can, we're not sure how we're going to share it yet, but it's it's going to be very shareable that way. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, there's a million questions, Steve. Okay. People are excited to talk <coughs> to you, and I want to start uh, throwing some more out and some shout outs of hello. Big Al is with us, by the way. Okay, um, I have to do this. Big Al is with us. Yes. Hi. That's Al's thing. That's for you, Big Al. Al worked on Fear Clinic with us, and he also used to work in my studio in, in Los Angeles. And every time I'd be upset or I'd be depressed, hey! I, I would walk by Al's workstation, <laughs> and he would see it in my face, and he'd just go, <laughs> and it would cheer me. A little James Brown pick um, me up. It's very much so, yeah. Um, it would instantly cheer me up. Okay, here we go. We've got, uh, ooh, we've got Darren and Mike watching from the UK. Hey, Darren Campion. Uh, we have uh, Justin from Nashville, uh, Mild Man Nerd, 
Um, Dan Perez wants you to kick ass and take names, Steve. <laughs> Stephanie Wong is watching from Hong Kong, and she loves your work. Excellent. That's Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we're going to get it back. Ben, ben Carrier, I, I think Steve did mention what the setup was for the librarian ghost, so we're going to move past that question. Mm. Um, Sample Lord, big Steve Johnson fan, the Doc Strange of makeup effects. And he's from Amsterdam watching right now. And he's calling me strange? Uh, and he is calling you strange. <laughs> the strangest, most wonderful city in the world. Um, we have Lord B.L. Thackeray. We are joined by a lord today, apparently, uh, who has the John Landis Book of Monsters, is not a huge fan of it, and hopes your book is better. We'll be talking about your book. Um, Custom Foo. Hey, Custom Foo. It's been 25 years plus since I've seen Ghostbusters. Need to watch it again to remember all this stuff. Please do. It holds up. It's hilarious. Um, Death Becomes You. You can answer this yes or no. Is there a coffee book table in the works, Steve? No. For now. We will convince him There's to... a coffee book set of encyclopedias in the works. And look at We've got a lot of people saying, I'd buy that and do it. Uh, how many of you would buy a coffee table book featuring a beautiful graphic tour through this man's career? Say yes in the comments. Um, Okay, rubber rules, search YouTube, see that is rubber rules. All right, now I'm going to switch over to Google Plus because there's a lot of coming in there. Um, brace yourselves, the yeses are coming, says John Daly. Uh, Christine Scarborough, yes, great inspiration and mentoring. Uh, the rubber rules channel is great, Chris Ellerby says. Excited, more content's going to be released there. Um, I'm just trying to give them respect. No, I comments. appreciate it. Do you hear that, Chris Dodson? These people are excited for Rubber Rules to come back. Let's do it. Let's do it. Jeremy James says, the greatest interview I've seen in some time. That's awesome. You haven't I'm seen not, a lot of interviews, apparently. I, I'm not sure I, I'm taking that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't get out much. I'm sorry, Jeremy. Do you see we how love rude you. this man can no, be? No, not rude. Playful. Um, what do you think, what does most, where do, this is a good one. Big Alice here, and he says, hey, oh, Doug Jones. <laughs> Doug's here? Doug Jones is watching. Hey, oh my Doug, gosh. Doug, you have to work with Megan. You have to work. Let her do your Android makeup. I hope, I hope that uh, Trey Stokes, the producer of your new movie, hooked, hooked you up with her. Megan is supposed to do his Android oh, makeup. A fantastic. test on Monday, and then, yeah. Well, all right. Hey, well, Doug, Doug, how's it going? For those of you who don't know Doug, uh, this man is one of the elite of creature suit performers. Um, he's a brilliant actor, and... Uh, he can transform into any kind of monster you want him to and has worked for everyone from uh, my father to all the great turbs to El Azalde, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Legacy Effects. You? Did you oh work with God. Doug? Oh, my God. I think I, one of Doug's first films um, was a movie called Night Angel that I must have done 28 years ago. Correct me, Doug, if I'm wrong. Oh, no. And you're, there was you're dating this, him. This scene where a girl had to thrust her hand into his chest and take all his blood through her arm. Mm -hmm. And Doug's like, well, I'll just shave my chest first. For no the, problem. To, just before you put the appliance on. And he took a razor without even looking. He just starts all across his nipples. And he's going like this. And I'm like, you're going to fucking cut your <laughs> no nipples off. No shaving cream? He, no, he didn't even care. And I'm like, wow, this guy is just really in, into the film. Oh, he's yeah. into the effect. Yeah. Well, to be he probably a, doesn't even remember that, but that definitely happened. Well, to be a creature suit performer, you have to have an inhuman tolerance for pain. Um, you do. So <clears throat> let's uh, let's talk about Big Trouble in Little China. We're zipping through your films. Let's talk about that one. Death Becomes You has asked for that. So okay, Big Trouble in Little China. That's all I get. Let's talk about Big Trouble. What kind of a host are you? Uh, and not go. a very good one. Dance monkey. Jeremy James hey, said this is, Jeremy James says this is the best interview he's seen in a long time. Okay. Back Jeremy home. James. We don't even know who Back Jeremy home. is. Jeremy James is my is my <laughs> alias. My wife is actually writing in under the pseudonym Jeremy James. Thank you. Okay, honey. well I'll tell you one of the greatest things about it is Big there's trouble. so many great things about it. I mean it's become such a cult classic. And I think that movie, that movie definitely still holds up. I've seen that movie. The other ones you mentioned, I don't even care. I've seen this one five, ten times since it came out in the theater because it's addictive and it's hysterical and everything about it, in my opinion, works. The effects, I had no idea what Carpenter wanted because he had just come off, it was his next movie after The Thing with Mr. Botin, which, you know, set the fucking watermark. We all know the most amazing physical effects ever done to date. And John was very, very angry with Rob. He's still angry. He hates practical effects people. He doesn't hate practical effects. He hates practical effects people. Have you seen the new K&B, the, the, the documentary on them? No. It's, it's called Nightmare Factory. You've got to see it. Nightmare Factory. It's on Netflix. 
It's, it's all about K and B. And John Carpenter's on it. He goes, I'm just, uh, when, when you get to the practical effects, it, the things come to a dead stop. They're the biggest prima donnas in the fucking business. Well, that is true. It is true. The biggest <laughs> prima donnas in, you know, it is well, true. You want to make your stuff look good. Uh, it's not just that. Uh, w- should we talk about prima donnas for a moment? And then we'll yeah, talk so. about the effects of Big Trouble in okay. Little China. Are you going to um, call me a prima donna? No. Uh, let me tell you this, having grown, literally being birthed. Oh, wait a minute, your dad, the, the greatest prima donna. Hello? And, okay, I'm not going to bust you on no, this. No, no, having literally been birthed into this <laughs> world, birthed into Stan Winston Studio, which was our house, uh, and growing up around you, you guys, I also grew up around a- actors. You, they couldn't hold a candle to, to the divas you would find in Creature Effects. It's the tortured artist thing. That's weird. It's, the, it's also the feeling of a lack of appreciation for what you do, yep. so that amps it up even more. And you all are the most sensitive uh, bunch of clucking chickens. What do you mean, you and people? You, You're it, one of us. No, I am, I'm an observer. I am an observer. All right. Well, you, as long as you're as long as you're incorporating your dad into this. Oh, he was the biggest. Oh yeah. Oh yes. He. But it's it's it came out of a, a, a belief in what, that what you were doing was amazing, which is true, and a belief that people weren't uh, properly recognizing that and treating you like a technician. C- couldn't be more correct. And that is because why. Because we are not vendors. We are not right. plumbers. We are artists. And, 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 and Greg uh, Nicotero put it very, very well. I just was at a convention with him in San Francisco. And uh, he said that, uh, I'm going to forget what I'm going to lose my train of We're thought. talking about prima donnas. We're talking about not being appreciated. We're talking about why, uh, no. I've lost you it. You lost it. No, but take Greg, a, take Greg, a puff. Greg was, uh, and it's lack of that nicotine. That might jar it. Greg, Greg surprised me with his genius <laughs> take on this, and maybe he can, maybe he's watching, he can come in and remind us. Nicotero, if you're watching, please remind Steve. That, so we need to know who the genius engineer was from Ghostbusters. That's going to be a tough one. I think his name started with John. And we need to know what you and Greg were discussing two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, let me let me give, go back to the fans well, for, for the, the fans, the viewers We were talking for a moment. about Big Trouble. We're going to go back to it right all now. Right, um, I forgot this is your show. Please. Uh, by the way, Buffalo Lamb loves Doug Jones. We do too. Chris Dotson, thanks for the shout out, Steve. Can't wait to work with you again. He's down. He's excited. Rubber rules guy. Rubber Chris rules. Um, Stephanie Wong also loves Doug Jones. And the pointless skills wants to see a dancing monkey. You said uh, you're not a dancing monkey. He wants to see a dancing monkey. Back to big trouble. All right, yes. Let's talk about the effects. <clears throat> what were your favorite? Well, as I was saying. John Carpenter was very, very burned by, in his mind, in his opinion, he was burned by both the critics and the film-going audience. The movie didn't do well when it came out. It was panned by critics, and <coughs> it went over budget and over schedule in John's mind because of Rob Bottin being the ultimate prima donna, right? Yes. So when, when his, he came in time to do his next film, he came in with both barrels firing at me on Big Trouble in China. He just didn't want me to, he didn't want to hear any ideas, he didn't want to, he just, just, he wanted the most simple, basic, non-events that he could ask of Voss film. But I, but I was like, you know, of course, I'm like, just like with the, the Botine and Ghostbusters, I'm sorry, the Baker and the Ghostbusters thing with the puppet, yeah. I'm like, I got my opportunity to, 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 to show Rob Botine that I can take his director and do really cool stuff too. And now John doesn't want to let me do it. So I did it anyway. I just wanted- Of course. <laughs> Of course. John said, I don't want arm extensions for the wild man. Guess what? I gave him arm extensions. Gave him three pairs of them. Yeah. <laughs> and if you didn't want me to do it, you should have been at the shop for the last three weeks. Where it's have you been? What I told him when he would become so angry on set, I would say, look, it's not my fault, John. You hired me. That's right. right? You got and Steve Johnson. I'm not going to phone this one. But I, you know, he just didn't want to deal with it. He goes, I'm seeing it literally his lips to my ears. I'm sick of makeup effects artists writing to set in a limousine. <laughs> Not. Oh, I kind of like it. They've got a, a bar there. back there. Um, raw oysters, hookers. It's great. Wait, people are asking us to kiss. <laughs> what is this about? <laughs> what? And why would you choose to read that one? It's only 10:34 a.m. in Los Angeles. <laughs> when it gets to around noon, perhaps I'll make out with. Steve this Johnson. has only been going on for 30 minutes. Yeah. Only oh my God. I know. We've got. We're going to be here all day. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, Buffalo Lamb is chuckling. Thank you, Buffalo Lamb. All right, so John Carpenter gets Steve Johnson, and Steve Johnson starts kicking ass on the movie. Let's talk about the effects and the ones that you're most proud of on Big Trouble. Well, I really enjoyed working with James Hong. 
Absolutely. And again, I like, you know, I mean, what drives a lot of us in this industry is we want, we, we are inspired by a certain thing. And then when we get the opportunity, particularly on a big budget film like that, we want to one up it. Yep. And so my, 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 my one up on James Hong's makeup as, as Lopan, the 2000 year old man, I, I wanted to kick Dick Smith's ass into the ground. And I love Dick Smith, but I, th I said, okay, but Little Big Man is the movie that got me into this industry. For so many. Yeah, no, everybody else, Planet of the Apes, great, fine. For those Edges of you who visible. don't know, we always have to, for the younger generation, uh, this was, he aged him to what, 100 and 120, some? I think he was supposed uh, Dustin to be. Hoffman Dustin Hoffman, Hoffman. Was And Dustin was in his early yes. 20s then too. So. so Little Big Man, IMDB it, check it out. It oh, was look a at that, photos. watershed. Oh, there you go. There's, uh, there's the makeup, let's talk about it. It's a gorgeous makeup. Oh, it's back in the days when prosthetics were um, opaque, right? Mm -hmm. They were white, white foam rubber. But my, my whole goal was, I'm like, okay, I, I, I need, this is my opportunity to do, it's my little big man, the thing that got me into the business when I was a child in a darkened theater on a sultry Texan afternoon and when I was 12 years old, I saw this and it just changed everything for me. It really, really did. And um, here I had this opportunity and I wanted to kill it. I'll tell you though, I, <laughs> I think the makeup's, I think it, it looks, from, in my opinion, again, talk about things holding up, not holding up. I think the movie Big Trouble holds up. Our effects, again, John wanted them to be cartoony. So the flying eye, the wild man, they look ridiculous. Fantastic. But they're cartoony and the movie's cartoony. Yes. Kurt Russell's performance is cartoony. So this makeup is kind of a cartoony ancient. Chinese um, man, it, right? Most people don't know. You know, they think uh, you know building a big T-Rex or a big monster is the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is really to create realistic uh, uh, human characters that are either whether it's old age or whatever. Nothing's tougher than a great old age makeup. Um, yeah, I, mean, I agree and disagree with that um, because <clears throat> it's always come very naturally for me. Mm -hmm. To do it, I mean, it's just the smallest amounts, but I guess the tough part is knowing in your head where to put those amounts. Yeah. And I'll tell you what's changed the business enormously, it's been a sea change, is the advent of these new materials. Yep. Silicone now has not only allowed makeup artists to go further than they ever have, silicone for prosthetics, mm -hmm. aging prosthetics, disguise, personalities, um, it's allowed filmmakers to write these back into their movies again yep. because for a long time, foam rubber is the hardest thing. You've got to be Michelangelo mm -hmm. to kind of fake the translucency with this crazy Monet breakup. And it still doesn't quite work. But with HD now and then the higher and higher resolution, somehow the, the artistry, the prosthetic industry had to keep up with it. And look, it did. Yep. And now you see more prosthetic makeups and more commercials and more movies than ever and more great ones. Look at Bad Grandpa, for God's sake. Incredible. I mean, my God. Uh, congratulations to, to uh, um, I believe it was... Steve Prouty. Uh, yes, but the winner was Robin Matthews. Yes, and, yes, for um, Dallas um, Buyers Club. Forgetting the I forget her name hairstyle, too. his name. Beautiful work, well done. Uh, but for my money, for a makeup to uh, fool people in the real world is the greatest uh, test of all. It, and, it, it, uh, yeah. You know. No, it's got to be, and, and I, it's, oh my God, I, di I did that. It, it, John Chambers did it. John Chambers, who actually is responsible for Planet of the Apes way back when. Uh, I think, believe he won an Oscar for That's, it, did he not? Uh, I believe so, for visual, I'll have to look back. But maybe it was not a makeup, but it might have been a, uh, an honorary. Yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. But um, he did it for certain clandestine CIA activities, I've heard. Yes, there was There might have been a movie about that. Yes. Argo? Argo. Yeah. But um, I also attempted it. <clears throat> I did it for Michael Jackson. The King which, of is Pop. All, which is very well detailed in your book, by the way, which we are going to talk about at length. Talk about at length. Transforming Michael Jackson. I know this takes us off Big Trouble in Little China, but we segue there through talking about makeup. It's a circus if, in here. And if, if we're going to talk <laughs> about Michael Jackson, we're not going to wait for that. We're going to talk about that right now. Michael Jackson um, contacted me to do a music video. It was that I had just left Boss Films. Some people might like to think I was fired over the Predator debacle. Ooh, uh, there's like another <laughs> wonderful topic of conversation. I'd Would like you guys to like consider, to hear about the I, first Predator, the I'd original like, Predator? I'd today? like to we'll consider it a, a mutual parting of ways. Is how I. Th it's how I. It's how I remember that's, it. That's that's fine. That's your memory is is all that you have. So I had this. You know, I had to go out and make a make a living somehow. So I opened a studio. I partnered with Todd Masters actually, and this was in 1986. 
And uh, the first job that came in, God knows how I got the call. Ah, oh, Rick Baker referred me to it. Again. He didn't, he didn't hate me that much. He's Send like, it to Steve. Take, take that guy. I hate this. Send it to Steve. It's like, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and what, ha what had to happen in the, in, the, in the videos, Michael had to transform into a giant dancing robot blowing shit up. And this was long before CGI. So this had to really, really happen. So, I mean, and it was, and so I, ultimately I figured Rick just thought it couldn't be done. So he's like, well, Steve needs to get his star going. Just, he'll probably figure out something or he'll crash and burn, right? So I go over and meet with Michael at his house, blah, blah, blah. It turns out that he wanted me to do some disguise makeup, prosthetic disguise makeups on him so he could go out in public without being recognized. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did, and they, they were, well, you've read the chapter. <laughs> yes, I have. I wouldn't call it a disaster. I wouldn't call it a success either, but I had to do it with foam rubber. It was opaque foam rubber on the King of Pop. Give me a break. <laughs> it was 1986. Well, you and I both, <laughs> we both have had the, I mean, my father worked with Michael first on The Wiz back right. in 77, and then also did a little bit of disguise stuff for him. Uh, at some it did point. He? he did. And then he uh, directed Michael in Ghosts, this long form music video. But mm -hmm. um, what a beautiful, wonderful man. And uh, you know, I, I've only defriended two people on Facebook in my life. Mm -hmm. And those are people who've said bad things about Michael Jackson. Yeah. So if you want me to defriend you, say something bad about Michael. Um, if you I, have any, I, I enjoyed my time uh, with If you have fun. questions about Michael, um, this is a good time to ask him since we're talking about him. And I'm going to turn back to your questions because they're flying in and I don't want to ignore you guys. Um, Do we have like thousands watching now? Uh, are we that there are, there's of Hundreds of millions, no, right? Hundreds of millions. Excellent. We've That's shut what, down, I was, we've, what I was hoping for. We've shut down the internet. Okay. The internet's done. So this is not even being broadcast. No, no one's <laughs> We're this. just having fun. We did. <laughs> yep. There's no electricity. Um, can you vamp for a moment um, about Michael while I look for a great <clears throat> question for you? Michael, vamp for a moment? Well, you've got to read my book because there's a wonderful chapter. I don't know. <laughs> the chapter itself, while you're looking for a question, yes. is really weird. The whole thing about my book, not to derail our conversation now, but it's very Walter Mitty-esque. And so my, my Michael Jackson chapter goes into a huge flight of fantasy. And I'm hoping that the reader gets it when I'm doing my Walter Mitty things because, you know, don't you want to read a, a memoir or an autobiography for the absolute truth and the dirt and all of that? But then when suddenly... Yeah, I don't know. You get it, though. Yes, of course. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, all right. Of course. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a wild rump suitable for children of all ages. It, it's not really suitable for children of all ages. <laughs> at all. At all. No, you're probably right. Um, all right. Uh, people are asking about, let's see, there's another, uh, oh, here we go. The interview got even better, says Jeremy James. You've said my name about ten times. I feel famous. Jeremy James, Jeremy James, Jeremy James, Jeremy James. <laughs> That's 14. <laughs> Jeremy James, 15. Um, Jeremy and they, James, he says Jeremy they don't James, let me Jeremy out of the James. cage much, so he's very excited. Uh, Chris Mullins, thank you for responding. Planet of the Apes got John Chambers an honorary award. There you go. As I was I right. We were, we were both, both right. Yeah, I was the right one. Um, and then you agree. For makeup, and that was 1968. Everyone's saying, yes, MJ. Um, thank you, Steve, for all your amazing work. This is Jesus Vega, or is it Jesus Vega? Um, I don't want to assume it's Jesus. Of course it's Jesus. Oh, Darlene Nelson is uh, loving on the Miss Doubtfire makeup, which was Canem, yes. Greg Canem, yep. um, who you've had some great experiences with. Uh, okay, here we go. Here's a Michael question since we're talking about him. Um, this is Sebastian Montpetit. Uh, as a longtime hardcore MJ fan, how was it to work with him? Was he difficult or easygoing? Michael, the, the thing about Michael, and did you ever meet him when he was I over the day? I spent a lot of time with Michael. I yeah. actually got to go to Neverland and did spend you? the night with my family and Michael. Really? Excellent. Yes. Well, the thing about Michael is he instantly befriended me. Um, and uh, he, I was living in the San Fernando Valley, and he had, was, this is still when he had his compound in Encino. The entire family lived there. And, um, and up until recently, <coughs> uh, they just moved, I believe. Did they? I didn't know that. It was like a year ago, but they lived the, sa the same place. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing, the, 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 I think the thing that struck me most about Michael is he was almost kind of pretty normal, but almost a little bit lonely, too. And he kind of, I think what he responded to with me um, way back all those years ago was that Michael was the only person I've ever met in my life, and I've met a lot of superstars that I've been starstruck by. Mm -hmm. The other person was Paul McCartney. And it's just weird because you think, I mean, not even Stephen King 
So when you saw Robert the Ebony Williams and Ivory thing. video, were you like, got too much overload? A blood vessel a blood popped in my eye. It was like a geyser. <laughs> um, so you were starstruck. Very starstruck when I met him, but I'm like, okay, okay, I've got to be professional, so I can't do what everybody else does, which is to lay golden orchid crowns at his feet and, 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 and not treat him like a human, basically. Mm -hmm. So I treated him very much like a human. And I think he responded to that, and he'd invite me over for no reason mm -hmm. to his house. Yeah. Like llamas wandering around, it was weird, it was very strange. And he, he would dress normally, and he, it was just a strange, strange experience because Michael Jackson is like Marilyn Monroe. Michael Jackson is like Elvis Presley. I mean, that was just such a cool thing. Just to have such a small interaction with him still mm -hmm. to this day, we're talking about it and people are typing in things. It was kind of amazing, really yeah, amazing. Totally amazing. And, uh, and like you said, you know, he was so kind of revered as beyond human by so many. Mm -hmm. I think he took great delight when people would just treat him like a person. And mm -hmm. that was my father's relationship with him. My yeah. dad would prank him and tease yeah. him and they just goofed off and he would tickle him and just goof off. Quincy I mean, Jones, it, yeah. his nickname for him was Smelly. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was just the greatest. Um, and not only a, a kid in a human's body, but also an incredibly savvy, uh, artist and business. He was such an interesting blend of those and I'll I'll you are you, missed, I, Michael. Let me tell you an interesting story before you move on. When I was doing, uh, when he was recording the album Bad, <coughs> I went to a studio to do You the, got to go to the studio when he was recording Bad? I did. And I, and I, went, I, I went there with a, an assistant, a makeup assist, assistant, to do, he was going to go see Jermaine that night. Yes. At the Universal Amphitheater. His brother was, was, was playing that night. And um, I had to do this disguise makeup on him. He wanted to go there without being recognized so he could walk the earth like we mere mortals, right? And I had a pack of cigarettes in my top pocket as I was doing his makeup. And he said, and he got really serious. And he goes, you smoke? I'm like, well, yeah. And he goes, I, I, just, I just can't imagine. And he, he judged me for it. He really judged me for it. And I felt terrible about it. But it, Michael and I are exactly, were exactly the same age. I'm still alive. It well, made me feel like shit for smoking. Oh. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Oh. It's like, this has given me this some This took degree. a weird turn. <laughs> <laughs> this took a very I'm weird sorry. turn. I'm sorry. Can you cut out the live stuff? Can you go back? Um, no, there's no going back. There's no going back. All right. That is the joy and the pain of this. Um, this is why they sent it we to are here. Off. We are here with the great Steve Johnson, guys. <laughs> Creature effects legend, absolutely. And uh, this is our very first uh, episode of The Monster Show, a live interview show we're going to start doing where we invite uh, artists like yourself to talk about this world we all love. So I'm going to get back to some questions. Yes. Uh, we got people from Poland. Hey, the Gluckon 712, or is it the Glucon 712, is in Poland. And uh, the Pointless Skills says, Gretings, Poland. Um, and then says, my spelling just beep everywhere. <laughs> uh, Sorov Ray says, wow. Uh, let's see, we've got, I'm going to switch over to Google+. And then I want to go back, because you, you mentioned something before you left Boss. Um, before Big Trouble, you mentioned a movie that I want to go back to. Mm. Think about it. Predator! The first Predator! Oh, God. We're going to talk about Are the first Predator next. Talk about, what, we, has this show been going on for 10 minutes yet? No, we're for only 48 <laughs> in. We have like three more hours. Um, okay, I'm going to get some Google Plus questions. Start talking about Predator now, and I'm going to look for questions for you. Oh my God. Are we predator really, really going to do this? Of course! One of the most iconic characters in the world. Okay, well, You're part the, of the, the storied history. The only problem with those kids is this. Um, I, I tell this story in great detail in my in my book, which Just, you should all buy. And now you're going to lose me. me, me no, hits. no, no, no. Promise us. Anyone you watching this anyway. broadcast, <laughs> you will buy books. Uh, Steve's book, no matter what he says today, right? Do we have your commitment? If you say yes. He can tell you the Predator One story. All right, let's if get hundred yeses book, on there, and then I'll. You can't have it. <laughs> so if you're going to buy Steve's book when it comes out, just say yes, and we will tell you the Predator story. We're waiting for the yeses to come in. All right. Um, in that case. I'll in just, that case. I'll meditate for a while Do until we meditate? get hundred yeses. Want to meditate a little bit. A little how, bit. how about while we're waiting on these yeses, tell them about your book. Um, let's let's that gets so much more. The predator story is so fucking old. Can we get me excited? It's for only once? old for you. 
<laughs> All right, let's talk about your book while you're for a little bit while the while, the yeses while you're are committing to buying his book okay. in the comments. Um, let's talk about this book. Oh God, this is a great book. This uh, this guy has written a book called Rubberhead: um, mm. Sex, Drugs, and Creature Effects, or Sex, Drugs, sex, and, drugs and, spe and, and Special, and special effects. effects. Yeah, it lives up to its title. Um, it's the story of this guy's life, and it's not just the time in Hollywood. It takes us back to your childhood, and it is an autobiography to a degree, but it's also a novel in that it's not uh, totally stuck to the veracity of things or the truth of things, and you're very open about that in the book. You, you, you say, look, I'm writing this 40 years later or whatever um, through a lens of lots of partying and lots of experience, and yeah, I'm making some of this stuff up, and you own up to it, but yeah. it's, it's thrilling to read. You, you jump around in time, characters transform, we cover all of your great films, um, and get so many great behind the scenes stories. And Very much like, the, 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 there's so many autobiographies and memoirs, I, this happened, and then this happened, and then she said that. What I tried to do on this was put it in present tense and make the reader feel like they're a fly on the wall when this stuff was happening. for. Yeah. Ghostbusters, American Werewolf, Howling, whatever. And we're a fly on the wall to some pretty uh, uh, remarkable things, not just movies, but experiences you've had outside of, off the set. I will never are, even be able to get a job at Taco Bell when this comes no, out. No, 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 you're an I artist. have destroyed every major heavy hitter in Hollywood. There's a little <laughs> bit of, there, there's a little bit of bridge, um, not burning, but bridge <coughs> searing. He sears. Well, they, they have to have a sense of humor, don't yes, you? Yes, absolutely. It's um, done, it's, when it's done with a witty intelligence, don't yes. you think they'll give me a break? Yeah. I, I do a, have to hoping. say, um, uh, there are a few uh, artists in town who are mentioned in this book, including my father. Um, Several times. In Look, it's a, it's a book about the effects industry. How yes. could your, your father's one of the lead yeah. guys? Because it's yeah, and it's not times. necessarily always in the most glowing light, but it's honest and it's your perspective. And I rewrote I it right that. before I sent you that. Oh, you did? You took out all the horrible stuff. I took stuff? out the worst stuff. Oh, no, geez, no, really? I didn't. I didn't. didn't <laughs> Although we would have canceled this interview if you had. Um, I'm kidding. No, no, no. We're we have thick skins around here. Uh, so tell tell them tell them a little bit about what what made you want to do this. Why? Okay. Why? Okay. Well, I've been, you know, for some reason, for years and years and years and years now, I have felt in the effects industry that I was not doing what I should be doing. I felt like my comet was, you know, hit another comet and I was bouncing around in outer space and my trajectory had been changed because I felt like I should be doing more. I felt like I should be being more creative. And I felt like, and I know this is strange for you to hear because of my history and what you've read in that book, but that really what I'd like to do with the, the next 20 years of my life is to be, is, is to help people through my art. And so I always wanted to write, and this is why I crashed my business into a brick wall in 2006, hit the road, disappeared in the jungle for a year in Costa Rica, lived with monkeys and toucans, and started writing, teaching myself how to write. And I've now written about four books, about to get published. It's the publishing industry, my God. It's just, it's just so changed now with technology. Of course. But um, it's tough. But I, I've, I've just nailed a great agent and editor, uh, Anthony Bourdain's. Anthony know, the Bourdain, the, uh, the chef, the... Uh, Globetrotting, globe smoking, trotting, drunken, You guys amazing. are two peas in a pot. This I am the Anthony Bourdain of the effects world, I'd like to think. Well, people say you're the Tony Stark of the effects world. That you both. look a lot more like Tony. All right. Um, that, thank you. But I think you're Anthony Bourdain is a handsome man yourself, man. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Enough from the from the side. Um, the and subway. I must say, uh, I didn't know what it would be like getting into your uh, book. I, I obviously know you're a very well-spoken person, and uh, I thought it would be good. But you you are a really really great writer. I mean, your use of metaphor and just all of it. You're just great, and uh, I'm very excited that. Uh, someone in the literary world recognizes that. Yeah, thank clearly you monster, so much. Fa monster fans are going to be all over. And, and this was my, my goal in writing the book. I wanted to write something that would be funny, and I like to think it's very funny. Although I sent the American Werewolf chapter to Max Landis, John Landis' son, mm -hmm. and he read it and he's like, oh, this is deeply personal and disturbing. And I'm like, what? I thought it was a lighthearted romp. I think it's funny. 
Well, one man's lighthearted romp is another man's deeply disturbing. So, right. So the, one of the goals was to make it right. funny. One was to include a lot of the, you know, the celebrities that would potentially bring some buyers, you know. And, and yeah. the other one was to make it short. I failed miserably on the short part. No, it's, <laughs> it's no. It, I would like to say it's comprehensive. It's kind of never ending. It is a life, and yeah. it's one. No, but it's fantastic, and I well, feel like you, you. I feel like I'm I've taken a trip down the rabbit hole, and yeah, I'm I know. in some amazing landscape of your mind and your experiences, and it's really, really great. Well, it's, um, it's written to make people think, and it's written, I mean, ultimately the book is a very spiritual journey. It is, and you've not quite finished it yet, I know, but um, I, I think that that was kind of my goal. I mean, here's a guy who threw his business away, you know, tried to, you know, very successful business, but making obscene amounts of profit back in the day, and, and went out to try something new because he didn't feel fulfilled. Yep. Well, guess what? It didn't work quite yet. But you know what I learned from it? I learned that it's even better because I'm no more of an angry person now. I'm no more of a less happy person now. I'm the same person. I'm just experiencing life through a completely different lens. And I think, you know, I completely believe in reincarnation, right? I just got reincarnated in the same life. Mm -hmm. I'm the second Steve Johnson in the same body, right? Oh, that's very And, interesting and I've learned so, so much through this odyssey I've been on. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, the next 20 years of my life are going to be the best because of this, because I had the balls and the nerve and the desire to follow my fucking heart. Yeah. And I would say that you should all do the same thing. Well, it's, it's got a, the trajectory of this, of this book is very Joseph Campbell, <laughs> very hero's journey in a way. You're, but it's inverted. You're uh, the sort of golden child who's kicking ass and living this life of excess and working on all the greatest things, and then you find humility um, and a rebirth, uh, a reincarnation. Yeah. And it's, uh, I, that you set up that theme very clearly throughout. And, I'm happy and it's the you humility, that. it's the humility that makes the excessive Steve, it balances, because you're always, you're, now I'm in my, he jumps time in this thing, it's crazy. He's like, now I'm back in 1985, now it's 2006, and I'm, no, in, there's, a, there's real, and I'm there's in a dirty a, motel room in Burbank or whatever, and you're like, wow, you just came from some exotic location in a, basically a harem of women, and now you're uh, uh, broke in a, in a motel in Burbank. It was like, whoa, these are some big swings, man. Um, I stole it from Kurt Vonnegut. Well, he's a good one to steal. Slaughterhouse from. Five, yeah, well, you know what they say talent borrows genius That's right. Steals. There you go. Well, we have lots of people saying they'll buy many copies of your book. Many copies? If you tell the All I need to story. do is sell one copy for $1 million, and I'm good, kids. If there's anybody out there that wants to... What about a, four copies for 250 k each? That would be okay. That would okay. work. Okay. If Two you will buy his book 000? for $250,000, <laughs> say yes in the comments, and we will cancel this feed, and you're going to go back to South America or I, South America. It, exactly. Um, Okay, going down the list here. Uh, is there going to be a new class with Steve, says Surav Roy. You bet. We'll just figure it out. That's what I say to that. Okay, yeah, good um, This is getting deep, says Andy Franco. Hey, Andy. We Our, could go uh, so much deeper. That's what she said. That's what, no, no. <laughs> that's what he said. You're right. Why is it, a, why is it always she? Can't it be he? It can be he sometimes. Or can't it be, that's what. I said. Uh, okay. You know, All why right. don't we, let's, that's let's start a trend. Said. No more that's what she said. It's either that's what we it's said. Not, it's not sexist to oh, say okay. that. It's just funnier. Let's just give it, give it some equal opportunity. <laughs> Duh, the chaos uh, psych says, Predator. I oh, Shay God. says, that's of course she'll buy a book. Duh. Delena Lopez, yes. Timo Jurinen, yes. Hey, Timo, you were with us recently. Is it Timo? I wish I knew how to pronounce your name. Um, my man... My nan got mugged by a panda, says the pointless skills. Thank Why you for that. Why would you read that? Because it's so weird. Can, can we get somebody to replace the host? It, John, oh. anybody? He's lost his shit over here. I'm sitting with you. It's infectious. You didn't have a monologue prepared. You were, I knew you'd fill in. I, um, the, you know why they got me with the first, for this first show? It's because they knew they would have technical problems. And yeah. They would be working it out. And and Steve, no one will notice. Exactly. Yeah. I'm the asshole that would do it. So let's just try it with Steve first. <laughs> he'll, Nobody's he'll, even going to know do, about the show. He'll do anything. <laughs> um, Steve will they do won't anything. even tune in. We'll get Alec <laughs> Gillis next time. Um, Joel so, Harlow. <laughs> Jordu Shell. <laughs> Fuck Steve Johnson. Um, no, we love Steve. Keep asking questions. That's what she said. Uh, 
That was a good one. That's what he said. <laughs> is that a building on its side in the background? Yes, there's a building How in the background. How about this set? This is a nice We are here set, at New right? Deal Studios, by the way. That is a, you're seeing buildings in the background. You're seeing some creatures, but if you were to see all the way around, which we might give you a little pan around, oh. you're going to see some miniatures. <laughs> uh, this is where we are headquartered. Stan Winston School has its offices here, and we shoot in this portion of the stage. It's basically a movie studio, um, and we, we get to play here. Thank you to Shannon Gans, uh, Matthew. Gratzner and Ian Hunter uh, for letting us play here at uh, New Deal Studios. So, back to some questions. Um, we haven't had a question for 45 minutes. Predator. Oh, They've God. committed. They've committed. Did you count them? There's lots of yeses. <laughs> Enough. Um, all right, so, let's, let's go. talk about. Well, you, you lead me in this. You've read the chapter. All right, yeah, here we go. Read. Did you read the chapter? Of course I did. Of course I did. But you said you were in part, the end of part eight. Is, is that in nine? No, it's in seven, I think. No, you then I've read it. it. Of course you read it. Because um, I, I take every opportunity to insult his dad in this book, and he's the guy reading it, but I'll tell you why. Matt obviously has our industry's best interest at heart. So I thought, who better than a best-selling agent slash editor in New York to help me with this book? And also, the man who has our industry's best interest. So... I, I do, and I don't really insult your dad. You know what? In the Look Predator it. chapter, Look but it. you know what happened. I, I didn't I've, make that up. No. I was there. I've heard it all. Uh, I've heard it all from about dad, and I've heard all the good and the bad and everything else. It well, doesn't. It, it's all fair it and just, war, right? It just rolls right off. It's all fair and war. When you're a public personality, in some way, you're but, going. People are going to say what they want. No, you're right, but it is war. Right? It the, is the, war. The, the movie industry is war. You've got to fight for that job. That's right. You've got to battle for your success. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about that okay, job. Well, okay, lead How me. Did it Help me. Look, hey, let's, I, start, I, let's start simple. Okay, let's start easy. You're pitched this creature. we mm -hmm. got to pull this thing off. What are we going to do? What, how, let's talk about those first conceptual Okay. Well, leaders. this was what year? This had to be 1983? 80, no, later. 80, uh, the film came out in 87. So shooting in 86-ish, so 85, 86, right in there. We're I'd talking say about the prep. original Predator suit <clears throat> that you did not see. In no, 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 but prep in 84 easily because I, I was long dismissed from my duties at Boss Film long enough to lick my wounds and open my own company in 86, so. Okay, so this was the tail yeah. end of your Boss Films. The, well, experience. it was the, <laughs> the, the very tip, have... the part of the tail that doesn't even have a vertebrae in it anymore. <laughs> it's the last hair on the tail. <laughs> so, you got it, so, the okay, skin okay. tag. Okay, so we have this meeting and uh, we're sitting around a board table and it's, you know, it's the, it's the usual suspects, it's all of the, Executives, it's Joel Silver, the director, it's uh, not Joel, the producer, sorry, it's John McTiernan, the director. This is only a second film with it at this point. After Die Hard, yeah. was it? No, 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 no. What Die, was before, Die Hard was after? It was not that successful a film, but this was definitely a second okay. film. Uh, another question to add to the list. So yes. maybe, maybe the kids can answer. IMDb it. What was, uh, what was McTiernan's first movie film, first before film. Yeah. Predator? So, I mean, I am so excited. I've done Ghostbusters at Boss Film already. I've done Fright Night at Boss Film. I've done Big Trouble in Little China. I've done all of the, the 80s greatest hits, right? So I'm like, oh boy, it's still the 80s. We can keep cranking them out. This is great. Practical effects for everyone Woo! on me. And so with great pomp and ceremony, McTiernan comes in and slams down a bunch of designs that had already been done by a gentleman, a production designer by the name of Nikita Natz. Mm -hmm. And they were awful. And this is what they wanted. Sorry, Nikita. Uh, Nikita, no, you know, you know it. Sorry, John Carpenter. Nikita, you know this shit. Sorry, sucked. all of you. Nikita, <laughs> Nikita, it was ahead of its time, let's put it that way. But the head did suck. The head was a no. So they said, uh, here's what we want you to make. And I'm like, okay, it's the first time I'm in front of everyone. There's 20 people at this conference table. I'm like, well, I, I, I can't make. What? I can't, I can't, number one, I don't really want to because Rick Baker and Rob Bottin will be carted off to the funny farm by the men in white suits and butterfly nets if they see me make this thing because it doesn't, Nikita, look good. But that's just one very small aspect of the problem. Okay, the so you're not blaming Nikita entirely. Not entirely. I just want to make sure. I'm blaming Nikita for the head. The Got head you. sucked. Okay. The head sucked. But what, what John McTiernan wanted to do is he wanted to, who, by the way, went on to do the Die Hard movies, you name it. A mil 
<laughs> he just got out of prison. Talk about karma. Did you hear that one? I didn't. John ended up in prison. I, oh, no, I think I did know that. Karma. But he's out. Just last week. Congratulations, John. Give John. us a call. Uh, we'll set up a reunion between you and Steve. Yeah, we'll talk um, about all that ass fucking you had. Whoa, to whoa, whoa! Oh, I'm whoa. sorry. I'm sorry. What's happening Matt. now? They said I could do anything. No, but that. <laughs> I can't say that. Gee whiz! He, that, do you imagine? My children these are watching. Hairy, me. muscular men. You directed Predator. Yeah. Oh, jeez. I get, okay, I gotta leave. Am I gonna be thrown off the set? You asked to talk about Predator. No, no. You asked. And we said I this told you I didn't want to. Okay. You get what you deserve. But then you, you went to prison with John McTiernan, <laughs> and I didn't ask you about that. So you, you, you know, you. Okay, put me back on track. Okay, back Tell on me track. what you want me to say, <laughs> no, and I'll no, say it. No. So <laughs> the designs. Were, the designs. Okay, so the designs. You weren't okay. thrilled. I, no, with no, Van no, Dam. It wasn't. No, no. It wasn't that I wasn't thrilled. It was that it was virtually physically impossible to do. Got it. Couldn't do it. Uh, it was, now, it very possible later, in later days, we've all done it. Todd Masters did it and the Howling 29. What we're talking about here are leg extensions. Leg extensions. Pumpkin head. With, with, hey, I think those worked well. Did you read the chapter? I'm going to jump over that couch and strangle you. Don't hurt me. I love pumpkin Okay, we're going to go. Okay, no, it's a great movie. I love the movie. I love the movie. All right, all right. The design of the creature is what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, so what they needed was a, a character with backward bent reptilian legs, extended arms, and a head that was out here. And they wanted to shoot on the muddy slopes of Mexico in the real jungles. And they wanted to have no overhead gantry, which means a wire suspended between two cranes. They wanted to just tell the guy to hop around like a frog. And it was Jean-Claude Van Damme who th had no idea what he was getting into. It was just, he was just off the boat from Brussels. He thought he was going to show his martial arts abilities yes, to I the world. Yes, I can do martial arts. What's the big deal? Some martial arts I for can you. be a monster. No, no, but he does he talk like that at all? He does, actually. He did. <laughs> but, but uh, oh, see, we could be here for the rest of the day talking about this. Well, we have another hour, so. OK, so, so Jean-Claude comes in for his fittings, and we start. We know that in the beginning of the movie, remember the cloaking device? Of course. Where he's kind of blah, 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 blah. I think, whose company did the optical effects on that? Strangely, it wasn't Richard Edlin. It was Richard no. Greenberg, I believe. Yes. Not in New York. Yes. Beautiful effect for its, its day. But we had to, for the beginning of the shoot, make a red version because red is the opposite of green on the color wheel. Yeah. They're being shot against green in the, in the jungle. Do we have that clip, guys? It's on right now. Oh, great, great. We're so, going to run it one more time, and Steve's going to talk about this clip. So Jean-Claude comes in, and... We are fitting him in this red suit and just assuming, like the, the slaves that we are, that the higher-ups have told him exactly what's going on. But he thought this was actually the real look of the monster <laughs> in the movie. And he goes, I hate this. I hate this. I hate it. I, I look like a superhero. And he was so angry about it. I'm like, Jean-Claude, did no one tell you? It's a cloaking device. You're invisible for half the picture. This is not you, which made him even angrier. Because he thought he could do his martial arts. He could fight Arnold Schwarzenegger. Impossible. <laughs> Absolutely impossible. He didn't realize that he was just kind of a stuntman, right? <laughs> this is funny. This is actually cracking me up to watch this. Because he was so pissed off about it. And never mind that. When we finally put the real suit on him, with the leg extensions, we had to have a flying Carnage, we had to fly him like Superman, like like Christopher Reeve through the jungle because there's no other way to fly the guy, right? He can't walk, he's got legs, he's got arm extensions, he can't see, he's legally blind, he's legally a paraplegic, he's legally <laughs> incapable of using his hands. We get him out there for the first shot and he's just seething. We got him in a lawn chair and you can see his eyes through the rubber muscles of the neck and he's like, I hate this head. I hate it. I hate, hate, hate it. I'm like, all right, Jean-Claude, calm down. So uh, McTiernan trots up to me and he goes, okay, JC, here's what I want you to do. I want you to run over to that tree. And it, it's like 8,000, it's four football. He goes, I want you to run over this, this tree <laughs> on all fours like a grill. Then do a backflip, swing off those branches, <laughs> then run up that hill in that distance. And I'm like, and Jean-Claude's in his wheel, in his lawn chair, seething at me with this huge, and I'm like, John McTiernan, John, the, the, you see those two cranes that it took us all day to set up? Jean-Claude will be running in the opposite direction. He can't possibly go over there. And, and McTiernan went insane. He goes, so now you're directing my movie. 
Oh. And I'm like, D -d 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 we talked about this, we talked about this. And he's like, well, just tell me what he can do. Just tell me what he can do. And I said, well, well <laughs> if, and remember, I had warned them that this was never work. He said, well, if we're lucky, he can run about six feet that way. <laughs> I'm killing Matt. <laughs> Killing him over he here. He wanted him, you, him to run 400 feet, but you I could said, give him six. I could give him but in the exact opposite direction that <laughs> McTiernan wanted. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not on all fours. No. And I said, John, think of him. It's like I was trying to explain the origin of the universe to a retarded child. I said, John, think. Sorry, John, house prison for you. I said, John, look, if we're lucky, he can go six feet that way. So we set the shot, shot up and uh, start to, because remember, what he's wearing a flying harness. He can't use his legs. He's got like these huge metal things. He's got arm things coming off. He's his head, he can barely see, <coughs> barely stand up. So we're flying him like Superman. So McTiernan calls action and I call out to the pulley boys to raise him up. And he just starts dangling out of the wheelchair and he's going in lazy circles that his feet aren't even touching the ground. It's like he's just floating there going <laughs> in circles. And I'm like, okay, cut, 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 cut. All right, lower him down, boys. And so, <laughs> remember, we didn't have a lot of time to work this out. We were kind of testing on set. So <laughs> it was muddy. It was the jungle. I told them it wouldn't work. Okay, so then we get him back on the ground. John calls action. The director of photography was just looking at me like he, his eyes could be arrows, medieval archer forces ready to shoot me. He was so suspicious. So John calls action again. Jean-Claude, I hope, go wide for this shot. Come on. John, where are you? All right. You got me. <laughs> Steve's up. Jean-Claude goes. He needs to be seen on the camera. takes one step forward. Sir, we're talking about all sorts of things. All right. We're going to use the moving camera here. OK, so, so Jean-Claude takes one step forward. And the, the pulley boys slip, and so he leans down. All the, you ever see those shots in Gilligan's Island where, like, it, it's like he's like a his face. He's like a frog on the ground, right? <laughs> his face is two inches. And I'm like, pull him up, pull him up, pull. Him. They pull him up as hard as they can, and a cable snaps. It whips around his leg, and he gets pulled up like one of those bolo <laughs> things, and he's just drifting there by one leg upside down. It was a comedy of errors. Oh. And he starts beating his, I'm like, lower him down, guys, lower him down. He starts, and the sun's going down, everybody's upset anyway, because we're never gonna get the shots. He starts beating his hands on the ground and screaming again, I hate this head, I hate this head, I hate, hate, hate it. And that's when the AD called, cut! And the parrots started flying from the trees and it all ended <laughs> kind of like that. That was it. That was pretty much it. Um, Our the, predator didn't work. Do you remember no. the moment, the very, can you share the moment that the news was delivered to you that this would be done? Well, I was in my hotel room doing massive amounts of cocaine because this was the 80s. It was the 80s and you had to. You had to, and it was the early 80s, and you really had to in the early 80s. Yeah, you didn't have to have a badge to get on set. No, you, you had, had to, to have, have a gold razor blade oh, yeah. hanging by a chain. Then you could get on a set. That's all you needed no to get into any film lot, anything. <laughs> the nicest restaurants in town. So, um, <laughs> they, uh, they, they, yeah, I heard that uh, McTiernan and Joel Silver wanted to come over and talk to me in my hotel room, and I'm trying to get the Predator back together. <laughs> And uh, they came over and kind of just asked, well, I thought they wanted a drink. I'm like, well, this, we'll, we'll figure this out. This is great. They're like in a huddle with me. Like that was almost there. What do we do tomorrow to get it better? <laughs> but no, they were coming over to fire me. Oh. And uh, you know, the, the thing that I remember most about that, 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 that fateful evening was McTiernan. Because we had done, it, they didn't use, end up using him in the movie, but we'd done an incredible arsenal of the Predator's other trophies that he'd mm -hmm. killed, he severed their heads from across the galaxy. And when he's screaming at me, McTiernan, when there's predator parts littered all over the hotel room, it's heads, body parts, I was trying to make it work. I was working night and day on cocaine. Anyway, he looks, he looks at these, 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 this perfect row of, of, of severed alien heads, and he goes, why does our, our star's head look like a football with boiled eggs for eyes? And these look amazing. And I leaned down to him. And I did everything less than grab him by the shirt and I said, John, it's because we designed these. 
Mm. Oh my God. He went and smoke started curling out of his collar. And then we started that kindergarten game, don't break the stair. Because I wasn't about to break it and he wasn't about to break it and sweat is trickling down our temples. And finally Joel Silver broke it and said, fuck this, movie's off, we'll figure this back off and uh, back, uh, back out in LA. Oh yeah. Then they slammed the door. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, as we know, uh, um, but it wasn't my fault. It was a bump in I the road. I tried to give them and what they And it was a wanted. mere bump in the road. Bump um, in the road. You, you went on to, of course, do wonderful things may I say with one, XFX. May yes, I say sir. one last thing about the Predator Please do. debacle? Please well, do. And I hope you're not going to take offense at this, because like I said, all's fair. No, all's, all's fair. fair. Go right? for it. And more. Go for it. So, of course, Boss Film relieved me of my duties when we came back. I think the echoing quote that boomed throughout the halls of the Boss Film Corporation was, well, when you've got a tumor, and that Steve Johnson is indeed a tumor, what do you do with it? You cut it out. Mm -hmm. So I was gone, and then I heard through the grapevine that McTiernan and Silver had come back to town, Schwarzenegger, they were gonna get the, the movie off the ground again, refilm, they'd seen the error of their ways with that ridiculous Predator design, mm -hmm. that terrible design, Yes. and that they were rebidding it out to have it rebuilt, and they were now gonna shoot minimal location work, but not location work, minimal, minimal stage work to splice into the film, to edit in. To, to what we'd done on location. So I instantly called Joel Silver up. And I said, look, I'm no longer associated with Boss Films and I'm ready to get back on the job. How'd that go? Joel hung up on me. <laughs> and then he gave your dad the job. <laughs> and it's become an icon. So what do I know? What well, I know? you know, you win some, you lose some. No, and yeah, and I have been fired as well, myself, and you're not a true professional until you have experienced that. And it just makes you stronger, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or it just drives you to take more drugs. Um, <laughs> there are children one watching the two. this podcast. I'm saying it was the 80s. <laughs> it was the 80s. I'm just saying what you said about the 80s. Um, I was too young to know about that stuff in the 80s. I was uh, 15, and at that age, 15, 16, 17, you know, kids aren't. Um, all right, so let's look even at questions. Even I have to keep my mouth shut now. Even yes, it, please some do. Some are even... Uh, <laughs> oh, here it is. Uh, Chris Mullins, thank you for filling in. Um, apparently, John McTiernan, uh, it was a Anthony Pelicano thing. That's why he went to jail and it was just under a year. Thank you for filling that in, Chris, because I was not sure of the... Uh, um, oh, and the, the film no, You should look it up. He did go to jail for a little bit under a year. Yes, and it's for the Pelicano thing. Yeah, but Ricard Antroya mm -hmm. says McTiernan did Nomads before Predator. Nomads, there you go. That's excellent, excellent. Thank you for that answer. That is the one. We've got a lot of people actually. <coughs> Low budget film. Eric Corvo wrote in Nomads. Chris Mullins did. Ty Zeman also. Thank you guys for shouting that in. They're actually um, paying attention to what we're saying. Yes, they are. And Darlene Nelson. Hey, Darlene. We know Darlene. Um, is saying we want to see flashback photos of Steve and his creatures. We're doing that, right? Yes, we're doing to that. To some extent. To yeah. some extent. We're trying, we're, we put together a basket of images. You can also go to um, our website to Steve's artist page and see a lot of what we're talking about, but we're trying to show you what we can. And there's also... Don't um, get angry about it, John. Yeah, I'm don't. a little bit missed. Who is that? Give me <laughs> What's the name? <laughs> uh, also, and this is kind of exciting for you to know, Chris Ellerby is starting a Kickstarter campaign to raise $1 million so he can purchase your book. So that's cool. Ah, um, see now, look at how social networking isn't that works. Awesome? This is great. Isn't that and great? I bet you it works out. I'm, I'm sure. going to buy an island and live out <laughs> the rest of my life. Um, okay, now, uh, is it too soon to go into the abyss? We're going to go into XFX now. The boss days are over. Um, let's talk about those, those first jobs, and then we can get to the abyss if you like, uh, where you were setting up your own deal. You're finally a man in charge of his own destiny. Right. Finally. Yes. It was, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. See, I don't really write like this. It was 1986. I remember it because that's when I met Linnea Quigley. Mm -hmm. Linnea Quigley, my first wife, the woman who was one of the stars of Night of the Demons, 1986 film, I think released in 87. She was also before that, the, she played trash in, in uh, Return of the Living Dead, mm -hmm. I think, the, the nude dancing. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't marry her? Right. I couldn't help it. I had no choice. <laughs> uh, but the, yeah, the, okay, well, so what happened was the, the whole thing with Michael fell apart on, on Smooth Criminal. I didn't get into that part earlier, did I? No, uh, you didn't mention Michael it Jackson, it, it yes. fell apart. 
Yes. See how it goes back to being fired on every single great Not opportunity every I have? single. Pretty much. No, what happened was the night that we went to the Jermaine concert, yeah. he told his producers the next, he ran away from me. He started, he, he, Jermaine is getting all the attention doing Jackson Medley 5, Jackson 5 medleys on stage. And Michael takes, starts taking his disguise off one piece at a time. And, you know, a quarter inch of foam rubber can't disguise that supernova stardom, right? Yeah. So once, once he started dancing in the aisles, everybody recognized it was him. And they just basically mobbed him and turned from the stage and he stole his brother's thunder. And then I never saw him again that night, right? And the next day I get a call from his producer saying, uh, Michael said you made him feel a little ill at ease and he wants to look elsewhere for the... And I can't even imagine why to this day other than I just didn't treat him like a superstar. So I'd opened my first company, gone way out on a limb to do this Michael Jackson thing, Smooth Criminal, the video. Eric Allard ended up getting the job, and it was all done with miniature robotics. Mm -hmm. um, the guy that did the first uh, Ninja Turtle yes. movie. Short Circuit, amazing robot. Eric's a very talented man. But, uh, so then I'm like, okay, great. I so just you've got a my... double whammy. You've got the boss departure, you got this thing with Michael, I can't, I can't get a break, and I'm, 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 I'm completely out of money at this point, right? But yet I just opened a studio with major overhead. So it was kind of sucky. And then I get a call out of the blue from a company called Paragon Arts, and they had a low-budget horror movie called Night of the Demons. It was actually called Halloween Party when I got the call. So I went in and met them. I hadn't even read the script yet. I went in and met them, went down to Hollywood, went to their offices, met them. By the time I got home from meeting them, I had a, a message on what we used to call answer phones, message machines, kids. You had to push a button. And Did you have a pager too? I had a pager back in the day. Did, uh, you, did you carry one of those around? I didn't actually, okay. I never had a pager. So there was a message from those folks. And I'd already gotten the job Fantastic. in the 20 minutes back. There's a light shining now yeah. on your new company. Yeah, no, it was really cool. And so again, I decided just to outdo everybody, outdo Dick Smith's exorcist makeups because it was a movie mostly about possessions and a lot of effects. And again, the thing that I always tried to do, always, I mean, from the very beginning of my company, from working with others before I opened my company, all the way up to the very last day, <clears throat> I never cared about the money. I wanted to do the best effects I could. I, I would put all the money on the screen, all of it, just to create the art, to take their money and use it as paintbrushes and just make the, so I mean, I could have gotten away with spending one third of what I spent on, spent on Night of the Demons, but I spent every nickel. As a matter of fact, um, because you know, back then, producers and directors, you know, they knew they hired an artist because they wanted that artist's vision, yeah. and they wouldn't micromanage, they would probably never even come to your shop or have you submit a design. They'd just be happy because they're like, wow, we got Rick Baker or we and got He's Rob got that Bertine. element covered. Good. I got the best. Let I know. Do well, I'll thing. do it with my actors and my story. So, yeah, so um, I, I literally.
<laughs> oh my fucking god! The thing that's so funny about that is that nobody has ever heard that story, and yeah. I will never tell it again. That was, ever. I have to say because I would be put in prison yeah. for the rest of my yeah. life for ten lifetimes. And I've done a lot of these interviews, but that story you just told me is the best. Oh my god! The best monster story oh, I've ever fuck. heard. Fuck, that was a good one. That and was. I'm sorry, good. you guys missed it. So. Um, I'm kidding. We haven't talked about we haven't talked about <laughs> He's anything. Fucking in- with you. We didn't tell a good story. <laughs> we, 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 didn't. we sat here like this for the last 15 minutes. Matt was actually considering <laughs> biding his time by doing something. Never mind. What are you talking? about? I don't know. Just- um, so we're back with Steve Johnson. Sorry about that <laughs> hiccup, guys. Obviously, uh, this is kind of cutting edge that we're able to broadcast like this on on uh, YouTube and Google Plus for you guys, but. We are at the whim of the internet, and we had a very brief uh, internet uh, hiccup. But we're back, we're, we're good, and we're going to wrap things up with Steve Johnson. Um, we are getting a computer ready so I can start scanning through your questions. In the meantime, we got a few projects that we should hit on. Um, let's, let's blast through some of the biggies and... Let's do it like speed dating. Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. We left off at... Uh, Night, of the, Night of the Demons, yeah. Night of the Demons. Mm-hmm. So XFX is on its way. Dead Heat was the next one. Fantastic. Again, Randy Cook. Bro. You know, it's, it's not fantastic. I, I did see I, that. Todd Masters rented a theater, and we watched that on the big screen about two years ago. I like the makeup. The makeups are awful. I I, you like know what it. I can't believe about that movie? No, no, there's some great... Again, I was experimenting. Nobody cared. Nobody held my hand. Nobody said, we're giving you all this money, so we have to know every pixel of what you're doing in advance, 10 weeks in advance, and then make you change it a thousand times. What they said is, well, we trust you. Just come do it. What I... Well, I look back at that movie, and I think it's a huge fail on my part, because why did the director, Mark Goldblatt, not look through the camera lens and go... That looks kind of weird, Steve. Should we settle it down a little? Why did the cinema, the, the director of photography not? There's some pretty over the top makeups in that film. Sure, but there's some great makeups too. There are. There are some good ones. But and you know. I choose to see the good ones. And uh, well, your dad taught you well. Yes, he did. <laughs> uh, it, okay, past Dead Heat. We're speed dating here. Speed yeah, dating. Speed dating. XFX. Dead Heat. What? What? You get, give me a hint. A hint. A hint. About after, the next one after, to talk about? After Dead Heat, was it? It's was up it, to you. Uh, I think it was, no, it was not Species, was it? We can talk about Species. I love that. It's, it's hard to remember. It really was, kids, when you get to be 54 years old and you smoke <laughs> and you drink, are you 54, John? John is the off-camera personality here. He's like the, the, the it's like the Howard Stern show, but you, you at least get a few shots of, of Baba, what's his name? Baba <laughs> Uh Yeah, Species was a tough one, but that was not the next one. Do you want me to IMDb and remind you of the no, chronology of your career? We can talk about Species because the kids. Let's talk about it. Species. How many Species of you was difficult. Love that work. I love that work. I think that is uh, a Giger um, sill is a Giger design. Absolutely. Let me tell you the right. interesting thing Go about it. Species and the design of sill, our female character based on. Natasha, Hen- Natasha Henstridge. The beautiful Natasha Henstridge. Yes. They, you know, they interviewed over 400 girls to hire her. But when Natasha walked into the room, they're like... I buy it. Yep. Killer sex alien. Yep. Uh, yep. She can So, play. you know, Giger's work is usually in the Aliens films and in every film that actually rips, his off, rip, rips off his designs, and many of them do, they're represented as males. But if you look at his work, at his vast body of work, 99.9% are females. Absolutely. And so we finally got the opportunity, and I wasn't about to let it go because Giger was famously very insulted with the representations of his work, the physical representations, in every movie he had done up until Species. Angry beyond belief. Well, he had such a huge hand in in the work on Alien. He did. He did. He sculpted the the space jockey. How could he be unhappy with with how it turned out? Look it up, kids. And what (laughs) what was the next one? I mean, he he. What what did he is? Giger is an artist's artist. Yeah. Which means he's never going to be happy. Like you. Ever. Never satisfied. Exactly. Kind of. But no, I I at least can occasionally sleep at night. Occasionally. (laughs) Giger is just angry all the time. So I thought, well, you know what? Was, was the least I can do, I love Giger's work. I'm, I'll make him happy. I'll do my best to make Giger happy on this film, which ultimately ended up being 4 a.m. phone calls for three hours 
while he's high on heroin, and I can't understand a word he's saying. Is this not okay? You Do you have proof? Okay? Do you have proof, Steve? We're yes. assuming he might well, have been on NyQuil. We, we don't know for sure. I, no, no, when he was in my studio, I took photos of the blood dripping out of the tracks. Oh, Okay, gosh. okay, we've gone too We're far. Live. We're live. We are too, live. You can go back, I thought. So oh, I'm getting whistles from the audience. Four-hour talks in the middle of the we're, night. We're back on species. Okay, with H.R. Giger, who faxes. may or may not have been. May or may not have been. But let under me the influence of opiates. May. <laughs> Or, in any case, I spent a lot of time with the man, and uh, he would get angry in the middle of the night, and he would draw in his patented scribbly Giger technique images of Syl raping Frank Mancuso, the creature, with a barbed cock coming out of her tits in his mouth. Unbelievable, and he would just write these horrible things. I mean, this is coming from the mind of a guy that's either crazy on drugs or both. And I, but I'm like, okay, but, 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 it's HR gear. HR gear, loves work, loves species. I want to make him happy. I'm just going to keep talking. And I, I had to make him happy, so I would take his call. And when you take the call of a guy that's on NyQuil. <laughs> Thank you. For a long period He's of time, at some point, it's like, you know what? I got to go make your monsters. I just can't listen to you anymore. Can I just go back? Can talk to my team and maybe implement some of your ideas, maybe. And so, all brilliant, by the way. Just want to maybe do it. Uh, species, now, yeah. If you don't but mind. he loved our work on species because not because of the work. Let me get this straight. Not because of the work. The work was fine. Everybody's work is fine. Everybody makes huge work is always fine. It's a great designer. It's great work, right? Great. Who cares. But he cared and he appreciated the fact that I paid attention to him because when he goes into his negotiations for his contracts, oh my God, he's gonna sue me for this too. I'm gonna have everybody, never mind the book, it's gonna be this one show. I think we all are getting I'll have sued. McTiernan, I think everyone is Del getting Toro. sued today. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> so Giger, including Jake on camera, you're getting sued. You're getting John Yukako switching feeds, Heather, lawsuit. my girlfriend, lawsuit Maggie, right there. coordinator, going all to jail. Out of here. Eric's in studio. Johnny, <laughs> Johnny's Teflon John. He's he doesn't not, care. He's not going to jail. I just um, wanted to make him happy, and so that's why he was happy. But the, the, the problem was on the next film I did with him, because I did Poltergeist 2 with him, I did Species, I did Species 2. By the time I got around to Species 2, he had had it. He's, I sent him, because the, the Patrick character, have you seen Species 2? It's not a bad film. Peter Medak directed, the guy directed The Changeling. You should check it out. It's filled with some of the best effects I think I'm ever responsible for. Because Frank Mancuso came to me and he said, I don't want to do it digitally. This was right at the cusp of should we do it digitally or should we do it practically? And Frank said, I trust you. I don't trust any of these digital idiots. Just just you take the whole budget, visual, visual effects, and, and you find a company and you just throw them some treats and you do as much as you can. And so we did and we did a lot of cool stuff. The problem was H.R. Giger, patently refused to start designing because he's often is staggering around his castle in the Alps <laughs> and we got to get something made I'm too much nyquil we got to make get that couldn't get rid of that head cold <laughs> Just so he finally he finally yeah he finally came out and denounced all of our work he wrote an email and uh, one of his famous scribbly cartoons and he said Steve Johnson's work looks like a fag clown in a Mardi Gras parade. <laughs> That's but actually a great alter, alternate title for your autobiography. You? A that, fag clown in a Mardi Gras parade. Just consider it as an alternate <laughs> as an alternate title to the Steve Johnson autobiography. All right, that's a good one. You're right. <laughs> that's what she said. <laughs> that's what. He said. All right, that's gay. Uh, that we're all gonna. Try. What's wrong with and and <laughs> what is wrong with wrong that? With Thank gay. you. Um, okay, Christine that. Score, let's get back saw, to... I, everybody go gay every once in a while. <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> right? <laughs> we, we, we have the monster Look, show I'm after killing, hours I'm later on. the crew over here. It's going to get a little uh, I hope you kids are more adult. enjoying this, too. Um, we have a few... Th <laughs> <laughs> Ricard and Troya says, we'd love for you to come on to Face Off as a guest judge, but maybe you'd be too honest. Um, no. I know you've been approached. Yes? Next question. Next question. Um, Christine Scarborough agrees. That's you'd... the only thing I won't talk about on national oh, great. internet. Very good. At least at this point, get a few drinks in. You'll me. talk about H.R. Giger staggering around his castle. On NyQuil. But you won't. He had a cold. But you won't talk about you going up. Okay. Um, 
Okay, here we go. This is kind of off the subject. Laura McLaughlin, I, I see your question here that you've graduated uh, this summer. You're going to be graduating. There's not any further study outlets available for you in Scotland to progress into monster making, and I don't currently have the funding to travel elsewhere for study. Do you think taking a course in sculpting and model making for film would be a good option? Yes, just stanwinstonschool.com. There Tuesday. you go. We just, that was a, exactly. a momentary shill for Stan Winston School, and now we're going to get back to Steve Johnson. We um, didn't even talk about the Robert England film. Let's talk about Robert England. Let's do it. Okay, ask me a question. Should I ask my, okay. Ask Steve, I'm going to ask myself. Steve, how did you enjoy, after an eight-year hiatus in the film industry, getting back to work designing and creating special effects, and was there anything that was new and exciting in what drew you to this film? Well, Matt, let me tell you. Um, it, I, I left the business for a reason in 2006, and you know you can read about it in my, my memoir. But um, Which finally, all of you have committed to buying. That's right. But I finally decided, you know what? What else do I have to do for the next couple of months, right? Yeah, sure. And I had a friend, Mr. Robert Hall, love him, runs a company called Almost Human. And uh, what I like about what he does is he writes and produces and directs his own films. He's taking our business to the next level so he can put the effects in it that we all want to see. Because mm -hmm. nobody's telling him, no, you can't do that, because guess what? I'm the producer. You can't tell me I can't do that. That's right. I'm the director. You can't tell me where to put the camera. I'm the writer. You can't tell me what to come up with. So Rob came up with this, and I thought, well, wow, that's really cool. I didn't realize that there would be so little prep that he would call me in with no warning to take a life cast of Robert, a very old friend since the Nightmare Four days. All of you, uh, this Robert England is, is Freddy Krueger. Please, you must know this. Yes, of course. So um, your audience is more intelligent. Yes, they are. You're but you, there might be some them. young folks who, I don't okay. know why they're watching this broadcast, but so, uh, if they are, they need to know. So he calls me in to help out with the life cast. And I'm like, I, uh, okay, I, what? What are you doing? And so I helped him out. And uh, not that I did it. I don't know how to do anything anymore. <laughs> but I helped him find people that could do it. <laughs> right. And I just said, hire you fool. <laughs> so we did a life cast of Robert. We didn't kill him. That's and good. Then, and then Rob went off to start prepping the film in Ohio. And I'm like, well, now wait a minute. You've got, from what I've read in your script here, you've got an awful lot of very, very complicated effects and hybrid digital animatronic effects. Mm -hmm. Who's going to take care of that for you where you're going? He's like... Steve, you're back. <laughs> you're back you in say? the you're back in the business. And I said, you know what? Horseshit. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, Rob, because I love you like a retarded brother. I'll do this for you. I will art direct your film. Another alternate title, by the way, for your autobiography. <laughs> Never go full retard. I know that's <laughs> offensive to some people. Uh, I'll art direct. I'll come in once or twice a week. I'll make sure you get the right people in the job. Well, what happened is the first day I went in, and I instantly caught the bug. And I'm like, wait a minute, we could do this. And if we get this person, we could do that. And if we do this, we can do that. And oh my God, I, st I instantly started working seven days a week, 14 hours a day, and didn't leave that studio until I went to Ohio. And we ha I, I hate to admit it, I had so much so fun. So much fun, and I've seen some of the work, and it looks Outrageous it's, it's, and it's, cool. It's, it's Billy Bryan who we did this, you know, the making monster. The mad, monster. the mad uh, uh, scientist of uh, fabrication and using outrageous the, materials. The, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Yeah. He's done so many things with me at my company, Men in Black. But uh, I had to bring him onto the show because I wanted to, you know, do the, the mad science. Just go. Yeah. Just look. What do you think? No, it's not going to be that way. How about this? No. How about that? No. We're going to come up from underground and spin around three times and shove this down your throat. That's right. We did some pretty fucking cool stuff. And we did it cheap and we did it quick. And it's really cool and I'm really proud. And with Rob's company, Rob Hall's company, Almost Human, we're blending the hybrid mm -hmm. digital that he also has under yep. one roof yep. to make some pretty amazing stuff. And yes, it excited me. And I'm sorry. I apologize. Effects are fun, guys. He's, is it had, a crime? The, no, look at this is very interesting because two years ago, well, well, two years ago, well, when, whenever it was we contacted you to get involved with this, you were not excited about effects anymore. I know you had to direct me and you cut out oh, all sure. of my negative stuff. Oh yeah, you're spewing you're like, all. Like Steve, try to be positive. I'm like, oh. yeah. I said no. we're we're on a mission. <laughs> we're on a mission here to inspire people to continue to make practical effects, and Steve's going like, ah, it's dead. Well, everything's dead. Everything's You're dead. You're going to have to cut this out. Yeah. And, John, and No, and John, I said... Cut this part out. But now Matt's two, being negative. No, but now two years yeah. later, here you are, 
you just supervised it affects movie. You went off to work uh, with Savini uh, back I east did. and I made a film a with movie. those kids. It's premiering at Monster Palooza the end of this month. Friday night, 8 o'clock on the 27th, I believe, of March. In Burbank, California. Yep. If you're in California watching, don't miss it. Um, and not only that, you uh, came and played with us for that YouTube collaboration, mm -hmm. and you did a fantastic... Um, out of the kit. Uh, out of the kit makeup. Yeah, and with Mr. Johnny Leftwich and Megan Arifert. And Megan Arifert. And then uh, uh, Rob and the folks over at Almost Human added they a fantastic... They helped remove her thing, yeah. So there's three projects in the last year and a half. And you know what it is? Things keep gravitating around me. This Doug Jones thing, right? Mm -hmm. That Megan and I are collaborating on. It just, it's, you know, I'm back in Los Angeles and I told myself, I mean, I, I read my book. I fled, the, I changed my name. I fled the country as a fucking fugitive in 2006. He, he actually never did. To come back again. And here I come back and I guess I can't not expect it. But in a way, I mean, I keep having to turn things down. I mean, I, I had to turn down like three things yesterday because I j I'm trying to do, uh, you know, the, the writing and the, there, there's just so many other things I want to move into and expand into. But, you know, once, you know, hey, look, Steve Johnson's back. Let's make him do an Android makeup on Doug Jones. I'm like, well, you know, I love Doug, but I don't really want to do the makeup. How about this person? So you will be a facilitator. Facilitator, yes. And perhaps a creative uh, voice in the equation, but you're not... Uh, overly eager to open up a shop again? Uh, not overly eager because of the overhead aspects and because that it kind of, I believe, sucks the soul out of you. I'll give an example. I loved what Patrick Totopoulos, tell him who Patrick is. Patrick Totopoulos, a brilliant creature designer. You've seen his work in uh, the Underworld uh, yeah, series, Godzilla. in Godzilla, the, the remake from way back, uh, host on uh, Face Off, the first Face Off for a while. Yeah. No, he's a genius guy. designer, but um, what he did, and what I really respected about what he did, is he would set up a corporation just to do Independence Day, mm -hmm. right? Bring all the equipment there, do it, get the fuck out of town, mm -hmm. right? When, when you own a company and you've got to maintain your administration, your overhead, it, you become a slave to it. And I, I don't like being a slave, you know? I, if somebody wanted me, like, again, like the Rob Hall Project, mm -hmm. it was so fun because I just got to go in like a mercenary. And you knew summer camp would be over and you could go back it to It was great because writing. you know you make money and then you don't work for six months, you gotta spend all your profit paying for the company, but if you didn't have that company and if, yeah. you know what I mean? It, yeah. it, 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 so the, I, I, I don't dislike the idea of doing effects occasionally, but just getting back into the rat race. So I'm just, you've said it here, I, I would call this an official uh, statement. You'll change your mind tomorrow. But this guy, if you're watching and you're looking for, and you have some money to give him, and you're looking for some consultation on your effects, you might be open to that actually, if you like I, the project. Actually, I prefer to work for free. Uh, uh, I really uh, enjoy working for free because that's all the only calls I ever get. <laughs> I'm doing another French documentary, a full day interview on, on Saturday uh, for no money. They're gonna uh, make thousands, tens of hundreds, and I get nothing. It's the guys that did the Harryhausen doc, you know that uh, recently? Yes, yes. Alexander, Alexander they're guys. wonderful. I did an interview for their Frankenstein, uh, well, it's the, the new thing, the Frankenstein complex. Right? Was you? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah I, that's the one I'm doing. Yeah, Saturday. yeah, we're all talking. When did you do yours? Uh, a while back. Landis and Dante back. just did a, a conversation. It's going to be it's gonna be amazing. Saturday, uh, Vulich and I are going to do a Fantastic. head on head all day, though. That's going to be no holes barred. All day. Oh, it's going to be an all day interview, yeah. Fantastic. We got a lot of questions. It's going to end, get... end in blood, li exposed livers on the floor. Ew. I don't want to be there for that. All right, everyone's excited that we're back, by the way. Um, and. That's the pointless skills keeps putting out very strange uh, messages like my nan gets bullied at bingo. I think uh, you get that one, John. Um, John, yes. Why do you have to be off camera? We need a third chair for John here. Dimitar Dimitrov. We, you can come on in, Johnny, if you like. <laughs> Our good friend Dimitar. Somebody's got to watch um, focus. Dimitar says uh, artistic freedom. What is better? We all know the answer to this question. Which is better? To, to do what you've got in mind with your design or follow the director's and producer's demands. Well, if the director and producer are geniuses, that can be fun, but obviously, to follow your own My big passion. issue was I was trained in the Rob Bottin, Rick Baker school of fuck the police. You came to me because you know we're right. 
but the business started changing and mm -hmm. now it's a corporation and this is why I've had so many problems why in my book you'll see how many times I, I let's say got subtly fired yeah. or dismissed because you know if you hire me I want to give you what I want to do and I didn't get in this business to work on a chain of command well it goes to I the, did, you know years right. ago of course I didn't of course and now it's that one of the reasons I'm out of the business I don't want to work for 12,000 voices does Warhol do that no no. When he gave the pencil drawing of his tennis shoe to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and they turned it down, I mean, come on. You know what I mean? It's like, he, he didn't care. No. I, that was his art. You and don't, is, you're not interested in being a cog in someone else's well, it uh, becomes creative. Now, it becomes now about making money. And money right. is a good thing, right? But this is why I'm so conflicted now about I could easily get back into the effects industry and make plenty of money, but it's not as artistically satisfying as going to Costa Rica and living in a treehouse and writing a book that never sells, you know? It's still fun. <laughs> I love it. The, the, the interesting trajectory in his book is uh, this man really lived the champagne life there for a while. Uh, and it's when you got broke that you got happy in a strange way. Um, it's such yeah. a cliche, but I mean, it's sometimes it, that's just the truth. You strip it's, all that stuff away and you go, what do I really want? Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it is, it's beyond a cliche and I've tried, I've tried to not be cliched in the book. Um, well, and there's a the reason cliches become that. cliches is because they're based on truth. Well, that's that, the reason stereotypes you know. are stereotypes, yep. exactly. Um, more, more questions here. Uh, Matt, not asking questions that we sent from here? I'm going to. Um, this is from Delana. Um, I had problems with my account. I'm using my wife's channel. That's not a question. Um, <laughs> please, uh, <laughs> Why'd you read it then? Did I miss Superman Lives? Did you talk about Superman oh, Lives? Oh, God. That's from Jason Lee. Uh, Jason Lee, do you want to talk about Superman Lives a little bit? Briefly, I thought we are speed dating. Well, this could be speed. Okay, speed dating. Yeah. Yes, uh, there is a gentleman, and I can't remember his name. His first name is John, who is just funded a successful Kickstarter campaign about Superman, Superman Lives. Superman Lives. Do you, have you heard about this? I, I haven't heard about the Kickstarter, He's got no. Nick Cage in it. He's got Tim Burton. He's got John Peters. He's got me. He's got everybody in it. And he's got the rights to all of our photographs and our behind the scenes footage of those crazy suits we made. What's even funnier is that in my, um, in my, have you taken a look at the graphic novel yet? Yes. Did you see the Superman Lives one? Oh, so that it's graphic novel is awesome. Funny. Well, the cover's not done. That's the only part that it's funny as hell. I yes. Think. So what, you get a bonus when you buy the book. Guys. You get a 20 page graphic novel of me getting fired from every huge picture from the Hulk to the Tim Burton Superman to Fantastic Four. Uh, well, it went well on League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but there's one other one I get fired for. Oh, uh, uh, Spider-Man 3. Yeah, it's pretty fucking funny, actually, but there's, a, there's this huge piece in it about Superman Lives, the Tim Burton one, and I've sent it to John, the director of the film, and mm -hmm. said, is there any way you could use this? Because we kind of cross-pollinate the book. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think he's going to want to use it somehow. Got so. to. Yeah, That's an ex critical ridiculous. part the, the of Wes the Wes Huffer, uh, an amazing graphic novelist, uh, referred to me by, by Digger Mesh, one of my, my good friends uh, in, the, in the toy industry, illustrated this. And I learned so much about storytelling because uh, I wrote this graphic novel really quick in line for food stamps, actually and truthfully. It took hours. So I'm like, what do I want to do? Okay, wait a minute. Uh, how do I attract readers to the book, buyers to the book? And I remembered rubber rules. I go heartfelt on Fright Night, mm -hmm. I get 5,000 views in a month, right? Mm -hmm. I put nothing up for Hulk, I get 200,000 views overnight, right? Yeah. So I'm like, I gotta go for the Marvel characters. And so I, and it just, it just went into this thing where I, I happened to be fired, and I really did from all of these films. <laughs> and so it's a graphic novel with me as the star being fired from all of these movies. <laughs> and it's pretty fucking funny. And it's really well done by Wes Huffer. It's, uh, and it is kind of fantastic that it's included in the book. I don't know many books that include a graphic novel as part of the book. It's, very, it's a bonus. Very kids. cool. Um, we've got some, uh, some people shouting in here. Uh, we've got, don't forget the abyss. Chris Ellerby wants to hear a little bit about the abyss. Okay. Just a wee bit. Speed dating? Um, speed dating. Okay. We're going to call this thing in 10 minutes, guys. It's 12.09. Well, actually, how long were we down? No, we were down for about 15. <laughs> Why don't we, 
On well, what planet no. was that five minutes? No. <laughs> we'll take it to 12.30. We'll take it to 12.30. I don't think Are I you cool with that? 20 left. more minutes? Yeah, we can do it. Okay, 20 yeah, more minutes. Go an so, hour on the abyss alone. We got Steve Johnson for 20 more minutes. <laughs> Keep the questions coming in. Uh, we're talking about everything. Right now we're talking about the abyss, speed dating version. You know, at some, at some point, I have to say this to you, Matt. Yes. I love you to death. What's wrong with me? Your father's legacy is great. We all know what, what you're I, doing what here. What did I do wrong? Okay, well, at some point, how many times can I tell your viewers about the abyss? They haven't heard this. These ones haven't these heard it? These guys haven't heard it. These guys haven't. You haven't? You want to hear about the abyss? A little bit. Right, let's get three yeses and I'll tell the story. If we get three yeses. Let's have silence until then. Well, actually, let's do better thoughts. than that. If we can get 10 yeses. 10? Great. About the abyss. We have to wait 30 seconds. Steve to will. Well, that's fine. That's right in, yes. You can come in and tell a, a Red Hot Chili Peppers joke <laughs> while we're waiting. Oh, that <laughs> While we're waiting on those yeses. I'll tell the story. Come on. We know they're, we right. know they're coming. They're coming in. Yes, they are. You, you, again, said. you've broken the internet. There's so many yeses coming in. Um, just give us a little taste. The, the 20 minute. The, I'm okay. sorry, the 20 second. The Abyss. I am more pr First of all, I'm more proud of the work that my company did on The Abyss than anything I ever did. It was absolutely not my favorite film to work on. But the work that we did do, considering that what James Cameron asked us to do was virtually impossible. How do you create an animatronic character that's translucent? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell and you how hide it works. everything. Well, your dad had done, by the time James did The Abyss, your dad, Mr. Stan Winston, the esteemed, Respected Mr. Stan Winston, had done what? No less than two films with James, right? Uh, yes, at that point, The Maybe Terminator. Terminator. Uh, and Aliens, and Alien. then came The Abyss, came and then the Terminator Abyss. Let, 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 let me ask you a question, Matt. Why didn't Stan do The Abyss, do you think? He, he didn't want to do that movie. Why? It's impossible. Exactly. Yeah. Who came along and said yes? You. Uh -huh. Do you have more guts than Stan Winston, Steve Johnson? I, I'm not saying I have more guts, but I was He young. did build a full-size T-Rex. Uh, I know. So and he was not someone to shy I, from challenge. You just said earlier that a full-size T-Rex is easier than a proper old age makeup. Yeah, but I didn't say it's easier than a silly translucent alien. Uh, well, I don't know that we call it <laughs> silly. I, I <laughs> researched. <laughs> I researched. No, they're gorgeous. Practical techniques they're of gorgeous. painless suicide <laughs> on the internet while I was doing that movie. Because... It was impossible to do, but how can you say no to James Cameron? Of course. You and can't. For so, those of you who haven't seen it, very quickly, check after this interview or even play it in a different browser. Take a look at some of these fantastic translucent alien characters that Steve did. Uh, oh, good. It's already been up. Look at that. Ah, they're wild. They're okay. I mean, look at that. These Just, things actually shot underwater. They actu there's no digital augmentation. That really happened, boys and girls. That really happened. Who in their right mind would tell a director six months before the fact that I can make that for you? Where Only do you, an insane person. Who, who does it? Who embeds lights? Who, who, how can you hide the, the mechanisms? And w did you do... You make them out of clear plex. That's you get the best engineers in the business. You try to figure out how to make it light and change color. I mean, fiber optics, right? Becomes mm -hmm. the only choice. Yeah. But you don't know that when you take the job. Yeah. When you're sitting in Jim Cameron's office, he goes, I want him to change color. I want him to be glass clear. I want him to actually shoot them underwater uh, and I'm like oh and he's I want to be the most beautiful thing anybody has ever seen and I'm, I couldn't uh, say no well how it, could I say no I mean it's the nature what's the worst it, that could have happened he the, a lot you. big deal how many look, times <laughs> creating the nature of the impossible Rick Baker taught me this and he said, if there's one way to do it, there's two ways. Mm -hmm. And if there's two ways, there's three ways. And if there's three ways, there's 20 other ways. So when you go in to a meeting and a guy says, I want a dragon to lay an egg, and I want that egg to open up and have 20 baby, baby dragons grow out of it, fly across the room, transform into butterflies, and then fly into ash, burning up as they hit the ground, tombstones, zombie butterflies fly out, end of scene. You know what you say, Steve? You say, yes, of course I can do that. And you have no idea how, That's right. but you just figure it out. That's right. So of course I had to say yes to Jim. And it, and it paid off. Those are, that became a seminal uh, film. I mean, those, those were brilliant puppets and that film ushered in the digital revolution with that water. With that water, you know, J Jim you know? told me in, that, in the first, he wouldn't let the script go out of his office. He was so paranoid. Mm -hmm. I had to drive down in the rain to 20th Century Fox. I've lost our audience. I'm clearly not being entered. They're texting over there. 
They're having private conversations. I, no, hope, no, no. I'm, I hope I'm still keeping you guys entertained. We were okay. talking about the CG to get... Oh, hour? trying to bring that image up? Yeah. No, okay. All right, in any case, um, where was it? Oh, yeah, I, I drove down in the rain to 20th Century Fox to, to, to Jim's office, and he wouldn't let me take the script away. He said you have to read it. sit there and read it. Well, that's commonplace now. You can't. Is it? Oh, yeah, they're so locked down, it's crazy. Well, look what um, just happened with, with Tarantino and his new film. I, I didn't and hear he threw it. a fit. You I didn't, didn't hear. hear it? What, some, some stuff got out? He gave his script to three lead actors. Harvey Keitel, I can't remember the other two right offhand, but he gave it to their agents, and somebody leaked it on the internet. And so Tarantino famously went on the internet and said, fuck you all. I am throwing this movie away. We're not making it ever. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Because someone saw the script goes, ahead of time. Well, because he put it on the internet. And he goes, okay, I'll just write another one, because there's a lot more scripts in my hair where that came from. Oh my it, God. It, was, it was something based on the Magnificent Seven. It was kind of his take on it. It was like the ridiculous eight. And something. dead in the water, thanks to the internet. Yeah. Um, well, in, that's, in any case, yeah. Uh, that's a shame. There are people just loving on your work in the abyss. I just want to tell you. Uh, Jesus Vega, beautiful work on the abyss, Steve. Thank Laura you, McLaughlin, I, I, very maybe happy. Maybe Jesus, you never know. Ty or Jesus. Ty Zeman or Zeman, uh, very stoked to hear about the abyss. Alexandra Gama Lima. Also, Alec Fredericks, yes, 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 yes. Sean Reardon, Abyss, yes, yes, yes. Andy Franco, hey Andy. Hey. Everyone was very excited to hear about uh, the Abyss. And I want to ask you another question. This is from Dimitar again, about Freaked. Some of the best work you've done to date, he says. Hmm. Uh, Dimitar Dimitrov, our good friend. Do you want to talk about Freaked a little bit? 1993. No, I loved Freaked. Uh, the, the challenge there was that Alex Winter the shittiest Lost Boy in the Lost Boys, I have to say. Well, and isn't he? Hold on. <laughs> he was the only. And Bill not and Ted's, but Till and Bill and Ted's actually adventure. Of them were, yeah, of course. He's great. Oh, he's great in that. Is it the makeup? But in the Lost the Boys, with? he was the shitty one. He was because of the makeup Everybody or his performance. Everybody was a supermodel except for Alex. Well, he was kind of the curly He went to a party at my house. The reason I say this, way back, and in the party we allowed people to spray paint and to put hatchets in walls and destroy Nagel paintings. And so Alex, when he left, spray painted across my original Nagel. Good night, Steve, from Alex, the shitty lost boy. Because oh. I called him the whole time of the movie, I called him the shitty. He was the shitty lost boy, he'll admit to it. But, and so in any case, he didn't hate me because he called me back for this show, he directed and he starred in it. But he had to sit through that makeup every day. Do we, We're, did we pull uh, anything from Freaked? Can we show, or no? We don't. Um, well, for those of you who don't know the makeup, Google it's kind of Freaked, outstandingly Alex Winter makeup, it's fantastic. Well, it's not, it not only does that new thing that I do believe, sorry, Greg and, <laughs> sorry, um, yeah, sorry you can be guys, but the, the whole tooth thing they kind of got from, from Freaked. What did you say? The Geniuses? What was Talent this? borrows, genius steals. There you like, go. Now, you can't watch The Walking Dead. If a, if a zombie doesn't have that half tooth, half not mouth, half lips gone. And it all started you know with, and it all started with We freaked. did that on Alex. It's, it's just the most amazing illusion ever. You make a denture. I wish you could pull up images. And then you put it over the lip, but you put appliance over that. That's the way half the Walking Dead zombies are done. John Vulich did the same thing in a couple of movies he shot in Europe. But... Uh, I don't even know where I got the idea. I think I was just thinking and thinking. And well, thinking. it's really probably cocaine. It's thank you so much for that. I'm sorry. Uh, guys, we have Cut 12 minutes. Cut it out. Um, 12 more minutes. I, I want to talk. Drugs. I want to talk general. Let's get off specific, <laughs> specific <laughs> projects, uh, and talk more about where things are headed. Um, by the way, uh, Dragon's Layer Bond says <coughs> love practical effects. They create a much better illusion when done right. Um, Necro Angel declares war, loves the zombie butterflies coming out of the ground concept. I think there's something for a new short film. We do, we, do, do we have Ever Loving queued up to show them, guys? Oh, that would be amazing. Do we have Ever Loving? We don't. We don't, okay. Um, I highly recommend that you also... No, it's uh, on your site. Yeah, go to the Stan Winston School YouTube channel and type in the search Ever Loving by Steve Johnson. It's a beautiful music video he did set to Moby's uh, song Ever Loving. Ever Loving. And it features some gorgeous practical puppets, underwater effects, um, beautiful stuff. And yeah, Jim Henson's daughter, Heather Henson, has a, um, um, a series of DVDs on called Handmade Puppet Dreams. Mm -hmm. And in the first one of the series, 
it features that film. Oh, I'm very proud to be on it. I didn't know that. Yeah, and at Monster Palooza again this year, Heather's going to be doing a, a thing, and she's going to be showing. She did a feature on Ever Loving. No, it's 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 a series of DVDs that are called handmade puppet trains. Okay, okay. And so they're all stop motion, broad puppets, you name it, but physical, Got practical. It. And she does cover some of Ever Loving, the process. No, of the that. very 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 first release. I'm in it. Oh, great. Ever Loving is in it, yeah. Oh, fantastic. You don't know about her? you got to check her I out. I know Heather. I've met Heather. I went, went back east yeah. for a Henson Ibex event. Puppetry.com. Yeah. Great. Handmade puppet dreams. I have to Monster watch. Palooza this year. Oh, It'll they're going to be there for the first year. There'll be a panel year, right? at 11 o'clock Saturday. Great. Great. I'll be there. On Saturday, 27th, I think, of March. Yeah. Uh, all of you who are in Los Angeles. you got to go. you got to go to Monster Palooza. It's amazing. Everyone's there, including Steve Johnson. Uh, I'm sure Rick Baker will be coming. He always shows. And... Everyone else, it's, it's the greatest collection of monster lovers in the world. Um, all right, uh, we've got a few things here to say to you. Love the zombie uh, butterflies. Um, Matt, could you ask Steve a little bit about his memories on his work on Dead Heat? Johnny Gore says we did talk about Dead Heat a little bit. We also talked about American Werewolf in London a little bit. If you started uh, the broadcast in the middle, after we're done, just go back to the beginning and you can uh, hear some great stories about American Werewolf. Um, holy moly, I've never seen the film. These are like undiscovered species, says Buffalo Lamb. That's cool. <laughs> Steve, you rock, says our own Andy Franco. Thank you for doing this. What? Um, our it doesn't people count like you. when it comes from in here. No, it, it, count. it always counts. Um, I'm going to just check for a few more questions, then we're going to wrap this up with an inspirational talk about where things are going and independent. That I'm looking forward to. Let's do that. Uh, Jesus Vega or Jesus Vega. Oh, this is hilarious. Jesus, or Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> writes, writes this. sounds really funny. Writes this. Thanks, Matt and Steve, for a great interview. Love it. Matt, keep up the great work. Thank you. And it is Jesus. And he just writes Jesus again. He didn't tell me how it's spelled. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, is it, is it, is it hey, H-A-Y, Seuss, S-O-O-S? It's Jesus Christ. Or we is all it, know that. Or is it G-E-E-S-U-S? -E -E Listen. Don't just you, write. Yeah, when you what, get upset, one? do you say Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ? Jesus Cristo. There you go. Um, ever loving. Oh, Magnu Ryu loves ever loving. Totally freaking awesome. Thank you for watching. The rest of you check it out on our YouTube channel. Uh, Ty Zeman says, Ever Loving is hauntingly beautiful. Ooh, I um, like that one. Let's just give that a minute to reverberate. Thank you, Ty. Hauntingly beautiful. Oh, we can play it at the end of the broadcast? Oh, fantastic. When the broadcast is over, we're going to turn on Ever Loving, and you're going to watch it. It's going to make you cry. It's going to make you cry, and it's all practical, uh, and it's absolutely beautiful. Final questions, and then we're going to wrap it up with my experience on Harbinger Down because it ties into where these things are headed and the Rob Hall thing Excellent. and about uh, taking it into our, our own hands. That's what um, said. Dan Perez says, I hope the other monster <laughs> shows are half as entertaining as this. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Only half. Uh, uh, Johnny Gore says, hell yes, he's the Tony Stark of the makeup effects world about this guy. Uh, <laughs> Jessica Fruit, Jess! Hey, Jess. Jess, says the Tony Stark of the effects world and she says, swoon. I think Jess has a crush on you. And you know I think what? you've met Jess over on YouTube. Yes. Really? Yes. Jess, which one? Um, Je there's only one Jess. Oh, yeah, she watched your makeup effects. There's only one she Jess. She watched your makeup uh, job at, Mos at Santa Palooza. Oh, you can't talk off camera, Baba. Uh, you have to get in here. <laughs> they can't hear you. Uh, so, yes, everyone's Heather, loving on free. Other people are flirting on me from around the world. <laughs> um, so, you've got to. <laughs> Boy, how do you know when to reject a job? I mean, to avoid abuse, to turn a freak, to Steve going to direct another short. All right, let's get into that. Guys, we're going to be done with questions now because we're going to be done with the broadcast in seven minutes. I thought it would um, never fucking end. So, this has been going on three hours, guys. Um, let's talk about the future okay. and the history and the changes that have happened in the last two years that kind of give... Do you have a more specific um, question? No, no. <laughs> it's not a question Let's yet. talk about everything that was from a, the beginning of the world. That was a statement. Okay. It's, it's going to become a question. Okay. Um, so two years ago, when we invited Steve to become part of Stan Winston School, his attitude was, why? Why bother? Haven't we all missed the boat on sharing uh, our love of these techniques? And we vociferously disagreed with him and convinced him to be a part of it. 
And over the last two years, we've seen a little change in your attitude and seeing you get back into things and realize that, yeah, maybe the old studio way of doing things is inexorably broken and won't provide a platform for artists like yourself and those watching to do this. But the studios don't have, don't have it all under uh, their thumb anymore. Um, Harbinger Down, for those of you who've been following, uh, is a perfect example of a crowdfunded venture, no studio permission required, and it is chock full of awesome I can't practical wait to effects see it. artistry. T- you want to go by the set today? So today? Later, later on today? Are you free? What, where are they shooting? Um, oh. in, in, uh, in Chatsworth. Why are they not very shooting close. here? You've got twenty thousand square. This feet. is not a soundstage. It's very noisy. Oh, I see. Um, the point is, is that it's happening all over the place. Uh, We've got friends all over the industry who are, uh, including you know Rob Hall, um, who are getting into making their own stuff and going directly to you guys to help them fund it. And I think it kind of opens the door back up to uh, doing it the right way. Um, and then we can show the Hollywood producers, see guys, look what we did. Um, isn't that bitchin' and isn't that better than an all digital approach? And we're not it's, slamming all digital. We're, we're trying to get back to a time when it all works together again, because that's where magic happens. So, given that, yes. what do you see two years later? <clears throat> what do you see on the horizon for us? Do you see a brighter future? I do, I absolutely do. I, I, it, there's an entire, and I hate to, to say, you know, use the, the cliche grassroots movement, but my God, I mean, look at what's happening with bring the runaway productions back to Los Angeles. I mean, mm-hmm. people are finally standing up and saying, no, let's do it this way. And I, I, I've never had this opportunity to talk with you about this, Matt, but 10 years ago, K and B, well, Bob Kurtzman had been away for a while, but Greg and Howard came over to my house, and so did Tom and Alec. And they said, oh my God, the business is dissolving. What do we do? We have to do something to, get, to, you know, to keep our industry alive, to pump new life back into it. And, I kind of sat back and I said, you know what? I'm kind of thinking of selling my house and going to the jungle and becoming. So, so good luck with that, guys. I had basically said, yeah, <laughs> fuck you guys. You yeah. figure that out on yeah. yourself. But what I did say to them, I said, there's one way. Come up with the content yourself. Do it the way you want to do it. That's right. And, and look, Greg Nicotero exactly is now executive producer of God, The Walking exactly. Dead. And he's and look insisting. At what Tom and Alec are doing. And Tom and Alec are making movies. Yeah. And that wa- the Walking Dead is the number one, one of the number one shows yep. in this country. And Greg is a great director. Great director, and it's filled good. with practical effects and puppets and, and mixing digital as well. Yeah, see, so I, 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 in a little bit, in, in a little way, I saw the future for everyone except myself because now I'm sleeping on the corner of Tahunga and Vine, in a park underneath a blue awning. <laughs> We're going to get a Kickstarter thing going soon. To we, get me. we need a Kickstarter. <laughs> uh, all we need is the funds to raise en- uh, enough to get a, like a month to month motel. A month, month, you know, one of those weekly Like a month to month? Weekly? Yeah. Hourly? Weekly's good. Um, hourly. And by the way, these are comfortable. You're Even welcome five? to come crash in one of these any night. I was looking at your, your, uh, your, your front entry out there. If I could see Kind of comfy, there. right? It looks really nice yeah. and nobody's using it. <laughs> so. So you, do, so you do see a change, you do see... I what? do. Look, the thing is, I just helped someone budget something yesterday for a huge Marvel project. And it's a live show, it's a traveling show like Cirque du Soleil. And we know those shows are not going to go away. Look at the dinosaur thing. Yep. Right? Walking That's with dinosaurs. Unbelievable. Traveling stage so, show. So, you know, the, the, the art that squeezes out of, of we artists that want to make monsters is never going to fucking stop. It will find a way. Because we will make it to sell to, to collectors of fine art. We will make it for live shows. We will make it for the movies, that, that for the directors, that, like Bad Milo, I just That's saw right. last night. Have you seen that movie? You should see I it. I haven't seen you it. You should yet. all see it. The best effects designer, one of the best, let's say, I, Aaron Sims, designed it. Aaron's brilliant. But he designed it. You're gonna love this. You gotta see the movie to understand how fucking funny this is. He designed it to look like a ghoulie. And it must have cost Fifty thousand dollars just for the designs to make it look as bad as possible. Oh, Aaron! No, no, we don't. We, but in a good way. On purpose. On purpose. Okay, so, good. Oh no, good. no, no, on purpose. And you don't hire an, hire Aaron Sims to do the. He, that was clear because it's got Patrick Warburg. It's a great movie. Great. You gotta see it. Bad Milo. Bad Milo. It uses 1980s puppetry combined with a little bit of digital rod removal. Oh my God! It's so funny. So this stuff is actually coming back, inch by inch, step yep. by step. Yep. 
Uh, we, why would these people have said, let's do it this way, other than they know people want to see it that and, way? And I think it's also that I, I know that for me, growing up around the magic of this world, when I knew, uh, you know, after college or whatever, I'd be an actor, it was because I knew I'd get to come to a set that I might be in a castle, whatever. I'd be wearing an awesome, you know, knight costume with a real sword and real horses. And that's why all of us got into this business, to come play make-believe. Right. And so even the directors, J.J. Abrams is a great example. They want to come to a playhouse. They don't want to come to a big green room. Um, having elements of that is fine, but I think people are missing the tactile quality of not only watching movies, but making them. Um, I could not agree with you more. When I was on the set of Men in Black 2, I walked onto Barry Sonnenfeld's set, which was 60,000 square feet of retro fucking modern American amazement. And it was loaded with Rick Baker monster, and it was real. real. And I thought to myself, you know what? It was really sad. It was one of the turning points in why I wanted to leave the business. I thought, this this is probably may, this might be the last set I'll ever be on that we all want to be on. Because there's re we all knew at that point there was no reason. We could have just been in a big green set. Mm -hmm. And it but was just the, so But what's beautiful, the fun but, in that? Right, because you've got to <laughs> think about it from the filmmaker's point of view as well. We want to do it. Yes. I've been making movies since I was 11. I had Super 8 movies. I, don't, I didn't want to make a, the, in, the, the, the invisible vampire on a green screen set. No. I want to do it with the neighborhood. Kids swatting at mosquitoes or what, you know? Well, the problem is when you, and again, we don't slam digital here at Stan Winston we School. We love digital. We believe that it's all about doing it right. And uh, I can't imagine the DP uh, would, would rather be shooting a green screen than, than lighting sets. A DP wants to light sets. A uh, production designer wants to design them. People want to build them. The costume department <coughs> wants to build. And I think we're getting back to that. I think there's a real embracing of the traditional crafts. and. Um, it's, I'm, I'm happy that we're talking two years after our first conversation and seeing where your head is at Well, now. let me leave you with this. Okay. I, I, I'm not certain that that is the case, actually, because growing pains are always painful. When your wife had your children, mm -hmm. was it painful for her? She was in quite a bit of pain. Right. So the birthing of this new generation of filmmaking and the techniques is very painful for those of us who like the physical aspects. But the, the, I believe that the digital vein is the, the place where the blood is going to flow to the future of entertainment. I really do. And I hate to say that because I love models and I love practical effects and I love handmade art. But you know what's going to happen? You know what's going to Imagine 100 years from now. Imagine art 100 from years from now. We've had imagine, this conversation. Right. It's, we can't even, our brains yes, can't comprehend but, but it. Yes, no, but yeah, he believes that in, all, in the future, it's going to be some strange <laughs> diode input, you know, uh, amazing drug experience. That's how you ingest your entertainment. And yes, that will exist. But the desire to be face-to-face -face with something that is real, whether it's at a live show where you can touch it, or whether it's on screen and you know that it was made by hands, that will always impress people. Understood. To, to this know is why I like Bad Milo, but, yeah. but, 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 but I'm just, you know. Uh, Don't leave this on a bad note, I'm not Steve. leaving this on a bad note. I won't note. let it's you a, do it, it. It's a good note. It's a good note. It's a great note. Look, in the real world where you exist as flesh and blood, we're going to have models. We're going to have robots. We're going to have lights and Huge T-Rex heads, right? And we're going to love making those because we love me. As a human race, we write and we sculpt and we make molds and we paint shit, right? But there is a huge trend towards something that we can't yet understand. I'm just saying, leave your mind open. Oh, my mind is open. All right. My mind is open. And I hope all of your minds are open. I know. I that left it on a bad Steve note. has that note. I you know, it's all it. good. You open on a, you, you left it on a great note, which right. is open your minds. That's it's a brilliant <laughs> note. Um, that's what she said. And if if Steve, <laughs> that's what I said. Um, this is green screen. By the that's what we said. Yeah, this doesn't uh, even exist. This is just. I would like screen. for any of you would like to say a goodbye message to shout it out in the comments. We're gonna say goodbye to him, but what better way to say goodbye to him than for you? to say goodbye to him. So write any fond farewells. I will quickly scan them for Steve, and we will call a wrap to this very first episode of The Monster Show. We're very sorry for that little technical glitch in the middle, but thank you for bearing with us. Um, I'm going to read some uh, goodbyes. 
to Steve Johnson. How about some goodbyes to Matt Winston? Well, you can lead those. Uh, a bit sad, but da, 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 the book and the zombies are truly. All right, I want some goodbyes to Steve. Rick, I'm walking. I said I just. Nobody cares. They already left. No, no, no. They're all still tuned in. There's a little delay. There's a slight. There's like a 30 second delay. Um, That's what she said. And we're. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they said. Uh, okay. Somebody, John Estrada says, somebody hire Steve as a host for a TV show. John, I love you. John is a development executive at Universal. We're very good friends. Thanks, John Estrada. How about um, you, John? Why don't you hire me? Uh, and John, you'll be, you'll be happy to know you're not the first person with that thought. Actually, before we even started this, I said, Steve, how would you like to guest host one of these? That's right. And invite one of your heroes that was, or whatever. That was um, at, at the, the, the Drown Oh, during thing. the, yeah. yes. Yeah, no, no, and even... Well, as Monster Maloop. Yeah, yeah. So he's going to he's gonna guest host one of these monster shows one of these days. Magnu Ryo says, bye, Steve. Um, and, J and Jesus uh, says... Jesus. It's Jesus, like, hey, Zeus. Um, of course it is. Goodbye, guys. This. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> that was so funny before, though, when you said, it's Jesus, and you just wrote Jesus again. It's Jesus, asshole. <laughs> just um, call me Jesus, you jerk. Um, <laughs> Chris Ellerby, Steve, thanks for inspiring folks like myself to get into this industry uh, and hopefully well, open your read mind. My book. Yes. Wait till you read my book. You'll be out in a flash. Ty Zeman says, uh, had a great time watching you too. Lucia, Pete says, I love you guys, in all caps. I think she um, meant me. That it's probably got to be you. When she says you guys, you mean, you mean him. Um, Laura McLaughlin, this has been both amusing and insightful. Have enjoyed. Thank you. Um, Chris Ellerby is a little worried about the other monster shows because Steve's a hard act to follow. Keeping it blue. Yeah, it was a little blue with Steve Johnson. Oh, come um, on. One oh, sentence. Man. No, there was more than one My sentence. Really? Did I keep... Oh, no, blue. Yeah. You don't, no, no, no. You don't mean sad. You mean, like, sexy. Like, like uh, naughty. Okay, well, that I'm okay with. R-rated. The sad part I'm not okay with. Um, uh, X fed up X. Uh, when will the book be available, released, and where? I can't find any info on it yet. It's because it's, 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 it's writing and getting a book produced in this day and age is of, it's like climbing Mount Everest. And you'll be lucky to find my frozen body 10 years from now because I didn't quite get it published, but it'll just be a boots, a green boot sticking up. We're now, not going to let that happen. It takes time. It could be, literally, when you go this way, it, it takes between a year and two years before they're on the bookshelves. Sorry. Hard mountain to climb. Um, any any chance of maybe releasing little sneaks before then? I've been releasing excited? a lot of sneaks on my Facebook page, actually. So guys, go to Steve's Facebook page. No, uh, I, I erased them the next day because I'm embarrassed. Oh. <laughs> That's ridiculous. No, but it gives people just one chance to take a look. All right, so <laughs> if any of these folks friend you on Facebook, will you accept their friendship so they can check in I on will. any updates? Yes. All right. So friends, Steve on Facebook. But they're just, they're flashed and then taken back. Um, it's like an Indian giver. Uh, Sean Reardon <laughs> called in sick today at work to be here with us. Thank you, and Sean. And says, excellent time, well wow, worth it. Wow, how cool is that? Uh, and Christine Scarborough is very excited for the book and everything else to come. Uh, let me hop over to the YouTube That's feed real quick. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> Change it up, man. I can't just... It, flows so much better that way. How about, that's, that's what, what it said. That's what it said. Do you know, do you know that's what, I, what they said. That's what they said. Um, all right, final little questions and then we're gonna call this thing. Um, Chris Dotson, brilliant, love the show. Thanks for putting these out there. Chris uh, Dotson is the gentleman behind Rubber Rules. Get it back together, come on. Come on, man. Um, Johnny, we're waiting. Go Johnny Gore says, take care, Steve. Thank you for your time. You've been a hero of mine for many years. Keep rocking, dude. You need a better hero, Johnny. Uh, Jessica, <laughs> yes. our dear friend Jessica over at Google says, the monster show rocks my socks. Bye, SWS guys. Thanks, Mr. Stark. She has a bit of a crush on you. Does she? Um, uh, Richard Brennan. John Ailes has a crush on me. Look at the way he's looking at me. Uh, <laughs> Richard, <laughs> Richard Brennan says, Steve, thanks for speaking with us. Miss you a hell of a lot. Ricky Vitus, or is it Vitus? Oh, Ricky, of course. Yeah. Ricky. Ricky! Let's party! Let's party! Was one of hey. We never even talked about the Savini experience. Oh, crap. Let's, uh, it's too late, isn't it? 
Well, will you I made promise, a movie with him. Will you promise to come on the show again and we'll talk about the Savini experience? I will. Experience. No, but we have okay. to do it before Monster Palooza because it's all going to be blown out of the water then. Well, you got to co. You got to host one of these things. Co-host we'll one with this. Savini. Wouldn't that be fun? Is he in town? No, he's in Austin Steve Johnson right now. That would be Tom really, Savini. Do you guys really want to see that on an episode of, of the Monster they Show? Do. Why wouldn't they? Great, great, great. That'll be awesome. Um, ML says, Steve, take care and accept my darn Facebook request, LOL. Okay, uh, you know what? Can I just speak to this for a minute? Yes. There are 5,000, you can only get 5,000. I'm sorry, I have many friends. He's too popular. I know it's, it's just, I feel terrible because I can't push the yes on anybody For those anymore. of you who are being rejected by Steve, he's and there's claiming many of them. it's not him. You'll have it's, to take it's it Facebook. Take it up with Facebook. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg. Talk to Mark. Uh, Demitar says goodbye, folks. Goodbye. Goodbye. We can't <laughs> wait to see you in person. Demitar is trying to close this show down. What uh, gives him the right? Trick to kill. May the force be with you. Uh, thank you. And let me see. Uh, Perius. Thank you, guys. Hope you will be live from Monster Palooza. Yes. The Monster Show will be live from Monster Palooza. Who are you doing? For two straight days, we're going to interview everyone there. In you two days. Have sit in a few we are going Savini with you. Uh, well, we uh, can do Savini see, now if Now that he's sounds there. good. But at the I'll Monster be there. Show, uh, I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm, I'm releasing Everlove on the Henson thing. Fantastic. Friday night. Great. Um, no, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm doing Nightmare Cabin Friday night. Doing an hour talk at eight o'clock. Great. Uh, Eleven a.m. Monster Palooza Saturday. The ever loving Heather Henson Will thing. Will you come in and do the Monster Show and yeah, talk to Savini if he's there? Yeah, I'd love Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Great. We're going to, the Monster Show, Jeez. this broadcast is going to be live from Monster Palooza for two straight days. We'll probably talk to about 50 artists. So no, that should be, be amazing. Yeah, that um, fun. Goodbye. Thanks for everything, Steve. Pete Holmgrim. Uh, uh, Ricard Antroya. Thank you, Matt, Steve, and everyone at Stan Winston School. Great work. Uh, Steve, you are the rock star of the makeup world. I love it. Oh, Johnny okay. Gore. Um, and when is the next monster show, Matt? It's My in a month. My girlfriend is still texting over yeah. there. Well, you know what, Johnny? She doesn't believe it. And she's been living with me for four years, so. Yeah, do that nice camera move. Sorry. John. We're going to do that. So we say goodbye <laughs> on a cool camera move, John? Let's do that. Um, I know there are more questions that we didn't get to, but uh, we are out of time. Bye. Once again, thank you to the wonderful Steve Johnson in studio. Um, and, and I am Matt Winston for the Stan Winston School, and a quick thank you to the crew. Uh, can we pan with that awesome jib, Johnny? Um, do a selfie, Johnny. Oh, this is cool, man. We're coming around. You're Johnny, gonna be do seeing... a selfie. Here. Is Eric Lidoff? Eric yeah, Lidoff. Yeah, Eric! Co-founder, Stan Winston School. Come on over here. Only one applause? How pathetic. Uh, that was pathetic, Eric. Heather, say hi. <laughs> Heather, you there? Heather Steve's, Rose, yeah. Steve's better half. Say hello, Chris. Chris! We got Chris Vaughn. Uh, slowly moving our way around. There's Chris. Yukako, the brains behind this operation, uh, running the feeds. Got it. And Maggie Sayer, you're not allowed to hide. Just wave. Oh, come on. Uh, Maggie Sayer, our coordinator. Maggie. And Eric Kusoja, my friend from college. Love you, Eric. Say hi, Eric. Now, we got everybody. Um, Matt, we got everybody but John. Come around John, to Johnny. The, do a selfie, John. Oh. There's Johnny Ailes. There's Ailes. Johnny Ailes. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, wow, the you're fabulous Mr. Johnny Ailes. <laughs> okay. Welcome. Thank you all. And Jake Borowski. Just hi to Jake. Jake. Jakers. Jakers. There he is. Uh, Jake Borowski on camera. And huge thanks to everyone at New Deal Studios, Shannon Gans, uh, Matthew Gratzner, Ian Hunter, David Sanger, and the rest uh, for, as always, um, giving us use of this fantastic movie studio. Yes, and uh, good luck to the Monster Show. How about a big hug? Thank Just you. Let's out. hug it out. Let's right. hug it out. That's what he's um, He's the man. Thank this you, guys. This guy is the man. Where's he's our close-up, John? He's the man. Fucking up. We're coming close in up. for the close-up and the he's big the kiss. They did request a kiss, so now's the kiss? time. On French? the fade out. On the French fade out. Or otherwise. On the fade out. Are we fading out? John, you're doing this wrong. And... <laughs>